there's so much bad information out there. And more, I think, I don't know if it's more so for women than for men, but the bad information for men doesn't cause as much actual damage psychologically oh, yeah. and physically as the, mm -hmm. as the information, the bad information for women. So thanks so much for joining my podcast today. Today I have a special guest. I would say he's my favorite author in the fitness and nutrition sphere. I found out about him, I think almost 10 years ago in a, in a German bodybuilding forum. I remember my, my English wasn't even that good. So most of the things I didn't understand, <laughs> but uh, we have him here now. And I had a podcast with, with Lyle one year ago, which became my most, I think my biggest podcast episode so far. So I thought it would be a good idea to have a podcast about women because interesting enough, I started to coach more women now. And okay. I saw there are some differences and I see a lot of women have still like myths in their mind, you know, because maybe of marketing and stuff. Yeah. So I was like, you are the perfect guy to have on my, on my show. Okay. You know, well, thank you for having me again. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. So maybe I just want to let people know that you had wrote a book about women specifically. Um, yeah. What's, what's the specific title? It's just like the women's book. What's the specific title? It's actually just the women's book. It, um, spun out of a project I'd started in 2015 and I kind of got to the end of that and and realized that I needed to talk about women and thought how hard can it possibly be famous last words um three years later I finally put the finishing touches on what is actually volume one the, the project got so big that I had to split it into two and volume one is just nutrition diet fat loss and then volume two will be training because otherwise it would have been like 600 pages long yeah. because women are just that complicated. Mm -hmm. um, it was an exhausting project. It nearly broke me. Uh, about every 10 years, I do a book project like this that just takes me forever and is exhausting. Like, I'm glad I did it. I learned an entirely new physiology. Um, and yeah, so it's just called The Women's Book. It's got a big bright pink cover. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's... It is technical. It is one of my more technical books. The, uh, I tend to, it's, like I said, about every 10 years, I write one of those kind of books. And the first half especially is a lot of background physiology, a lot of science. And then I tried, then the second half is really much more applied in terms of setting up diet for different situations. Because I know we'll talk about this, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Does a woman have a menstrual cycle? Is she on birth control? Polycystic ovary syndrome. What changes as women get older? Yeah. And men are basically the same from start to finish, right? From puberty to death, we're just kind of the same version of ourself. Whereas women have these enormous changes throughout the lifestyle, or sorry, throughout the lifespan. Um, and that's a lot of what makes it so complicated is I wanted to try to cover all those different considerations, all the different situations mm -hmm. women might experience. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was an exhausting project. I'm, I'm glad I did it in hindsight. It's pretty exhausting yeah. during, but yeah. So I'm just curious, you wrote several books about men, I think, and then you decided to write one about women because you realized it's just, you, you need to make, you write a whole book about it, right? Because it's so dense, the topic, it's so, so big. Get basis. So what, what had happened, as I said, at the end of this project, and I don't know that my other books were necessarily for men, they just weren't uh, delineated. It was just like, here's general, because we'll talk about the same principles apply. The principles will always apply. Women face issues and considerations that men simply don't. And you often are, are having to work within their physiology, within even their psychology, which can be different. Um, so it wasn't so much that I even set out to as I got to the end of this project and had like this little section and I'm like, oh, I have to write about women now. And I started working on it and everybody on my Facebook, well, the women were like, oh my God, we need this book. Because let's face it, there's a million books out there that are either general or for men. Because yeah. everyone keeps asking me, why don't you write the men's book? Because they've already been written. There is more information than any man ever needs on training, diet, all that. There's very little written about women. And it's either clinical textbooks, because I've got all of them on my shelves, right? Very sports medicine or very, it, they're aimed at researchers, or there's a limited amount of sort of general, uh, you know, popular books. And I've read them all and they vary. Some of them are okay, some of them are not. And so then, then I came along and the deeper I got into the project, 
the more it in got it, the more involved it got. And and I probably could have kept going for another ten years, right? At some point, you just have to go enough. Yeah, <laughs> I've yeah. I've gotten as deeply as I can go yeah. into it. Um, so it wasn't so much planned as as I started getting into it. It was clear that that was a priority over this other project that, that it sort of fell out of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, and it was a book that needed to be written because the information just wasn't, or it's, it's in fits and spurts. If you search the, the internet on women's fat loss or, or whatever, you can find snippets of it. A lot of what's out there is just wrong, um, whether it's for whatever reason. Do you have an example, so by the way? This was, Do you have an example of something that's like- uh, Not off the top of my head, but occasionally I'll go look up articles. It's been a few years and it's like, they'll get some basic element of either the menstrual cycle wrong or the way hormones are working in a woman's body. And I mean, one of the things that really um, became clear to me and realized as a man, I was starting from zero, right? Uh -huh. Like so, I had experienced it through trainees, through girlfriends, but mm -hmm. to actually understand the physiology, I was starting from scratch. What is the menstrual cycle? What are these different parts of it? What are the hormones doing? But as I wrote about this, and maybe this is an American thing, I don't know what it's like in, in not America, but so many women told me, I don't know any of this either, because it's not taught in our country. Same, same, yeah, same, yeah. yeah and it, yeah. So, so when, you know, if, if women are not being taught this in any sort of academic or practical way, like what chance do men have, right? Whether male athletes, male coaches, males, you know, in relate, like we're completely in the dark. And women, and again, this isn't meant to be critical, this is just women aren't taught this. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. No worries. No worries. I love the bookshelf. <laughs> Maybe you can spot some good books. Sorry about that. Had a lot of no, talk good. Um, so good. Yeah, so I was really, like I said, so was just starting from scratch and then building up from there. And then mm -hmm. I, as I got into it, birth control was a nightmare. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Address yeah. polycystic ovary syndrome, which is the most common reproductive disorder in women and huge, huge, huge issue to consider. Yeah. And then yeah. menopause, like we talked about. And um, so, yeah, I was trying to cover every eventuality and it just, so it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and bigger. So, yeah. There you go. yeah, I can tell, yeah. It's funny you mentioned that also my girlfriend came to me. She was like, yeah, my mom never told me this. And you know, her teacher never told her. So she had also had to learn her. I was like, that's interesting. I never thought about this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, I think some of it, I mean, in the U.S., it's just because we're very puritanical and sex education doesn't exist and just because of the nature of our country, but there's still so many myths. There's such a stigma about it, about women being, you know, unclean and impure and all these other things. And generationally, you mm -hmm. know, I think like my mom or your girlfriend's mom are of the generation that it just wasn't spoken. It just wasn't talked about culturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, or what I suspect is, I mean, the internet is, we all know, it's just changed the, we are, a generation has been raised, your, you know, your girlfriend's generation that is different. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way, but in the sense of having had access to all this information, being, growing up in a very different cultural landscape, that I think this will, it will start changing over time. Because yeah. now that your girlfriend is educated about it, I guarantee you when she has kids and has a daughter, she will absolutely explain this stuff in the way that sex educate. It, 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 and it, probably the best, another example that maybe we'll talk about is, you know, in terms of weight training. My, I've, I've, I'm old, I've lived through the years. Women were just not in the weight room by and large for most of my career. In the last 10 or 15 years or so, that's completely changed. You know, my mom is of the generation. She was told, oh, don't lift weights. It'll make you bulky. It'll make yeah. you fertile, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And then women saw, you know, and again, Instagram, it has its good, it has its bad. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, here are women that are lifting, you know, all the weights. And this is a loaded term. And I want to be careful with how I use it. You know, they still remain feminine, whatever you want to. I live in the U.S. I've got to deal with all the things, yeah, I know. Correct, social yeah. justice, work. but I, and I don't want to be misinterpreted. But they're seeing that. Oh my God, I just, female powerlifting is like forty-five to fifty percent women. And we've raised uh, the new generation brought up it has come up lifting weights. Yeah, 
their daughters are not going to be taught girls can't do sports. They're not going to be taught this is going to make your ovaries fall out. Yeah. And I think just like the menstrual cycle, we're going to see a progressive change over that. Yeah. But as of right now, the previous generation, it just wasn't yeah. taught or talked about. And there's still religious issues. There will always be cultures that won't talk about this. Um, I did another podcast uh, and we talked about this and, and one woman, that was a group Zoom call, she's like, I've got a question. She's like, but I'm, I'm really embarrassed to ask about it because culturally and religiously, she's just like, this is not a topic to be discussed. And I'm like, can't embarrass me, like feel free, you know, stay anonymous, whatever. Like this needs to get talked about more. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, per perfect bridge because I want to talk about myths here. Uh, what are common sure. myths that women still believe that are, that are not true? Um, you mean about just the menstrual cycle in general or? Yeah. Let's start with like nutrition and fat loss based on that and then you can go yeah. deeper. Yeah. I, you know, it's a lot of what I'm going to say is, is really going to be based on, you know, again, my, my career. Things have definitely changed in the last five or 10 years. But I would say that the big ones, the big ones that I typically saw were, you know, protein will make you bulky or protein will make you muscular. And I have found, again, women often, it's very difficult to get them to eat sufficient amounts of protein. Oh yeah. Some of it, some of this, and make no mistake, some of this is biological. Women have different, women tend to prefer carbohydrates and fats. Men tend to prefer proteins and fats. Many women are not raised eating much protein. They don't have a taste for it. They may have ethical, whatever, whatever the reason. But I think some of that is still the, ah, okay. When guys want to get big, they lift weights and eat lots of protein. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't want to get big, therefore I will avoid both of those. So that, oh, yeah. that I think is one of them. That also ties in with the second one, which is still that fat makes you fat. This has been around for decades. And I was around in the 80s when a lot of this goofiness really started. And I think that ties in with the protein thing because a lot of proteins have fat. So what do women do? They're like, well, I want to cut fat as low as I can because fat makes you fat. Protein has fat and protein makes me, so I want to cut. And they end up living on like 80% starches. They have terrible, their energy levels are up and down and up and down. They don't get the results that they want. Um, I'd say diet wise, that's probably the big ones. You know, you can also get into a, a lot of the ideas about how to lose fat. And, and I wanna make it clear that the, again, this isn't me being critical of women. This is the information that is being presented to women, right? There's decades of media telling women, this is how you diet. You starve yourself, the lower the calories, the better. Oh, yeah. You know, the old way, it's like, all right, have a you know, have a bagel for breakfast, a plain salad for lunch, maybe a little protein at dinner. The less you eat, the better. The more cardio you do, the yeah. better. Don't mm -hmm. lift heavy weights. Like this is all so entrenched. Socially and acceptable, again, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's just how, how women have traditionally dieted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there is like, again, things have changed and I'll address some of that. But, you know, back in the day, if a guy wanted to lose weight, get in shape, he would hit the weight room, and eat all the protein, right? Men love Atkins diets. Men love low carb diets. Oh, I get to diet on bacon and cheat? Hell yeah. Whereas women would hit the cardio deck and cut their calories as far as they could and nothing would happen. And as I'll sort of come back to in a little bit, like in many, many ways, when women, this is a place where women should adopt more, you know, male approaches to fat loss. And again, I said, I, I don't want to turn it into a big gender thing. It's just traditionally that's, it has changed though. And you can find endless women who did the cardio grind, the excess car, low calories, and suddenly they find weight training through whatever means. They said they want to power lift, start training, it doesn't matter. Once they get into that weight training subculture, higher protein is always part of it. It's just, in, it's, it's part of the package. Well, when you get your protein moderate, get your dietary fat up, carbs come down, and it's a magic trick. Yeah. And in two months, they will see changes, transfer, whether, they, whether they reduce their cardio, some will eliminate it completely. And in two months, they'll make more, get more results than they did in two years. Oh yeah. But anyway, we'll, yeah. we'll get into sort of why some of that is. Yeah. So I think those are the really the big diet ones. The less calories you eat, the better. 
Um, and actually, so this is, again, this is a cultural thing. Uh, you know what Barbie is? Yep, Barbie, yep. Yeah. yeah, so Big Doll over in the US, and there is a, an infamous 1960s Barbie doll. And it came with a scale and a little toy book. And on the front, it said, how to lose weight. You flip it over and it says, don't eat. And if you Google that, just Google Barbie, let me, let me check. how to lose weight. Uh -huh. It's let me get it my go screen. over well. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me check it out. Just go on, I will check, check it out if I find it. Oh, yeah. You know, but that's, uh -huh. that's sort of traditionally how it was done, uh -huh. you know? And there's still, like I said, there's just so yeah, much, yeah. so much bad. In, yeah, exactly. You can, yeah. I agree. Oops. Oops. I agree, of course. What was it? Oh, 1965. Oh, just, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you go back, you can just see the images over here on the right hand. Go back one more uh, or go to the not, images then, tab. Oh, here. Barbie. Ninth, yeah. The images. This. Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah right there. Right. So this, Don't this, eat. this is what little girls, this was like their first, uh, exposure in the 1950s. Crazy. Phenomenal. Right. Just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. So anyway, so I think, I think those are the big ones when it comes to diet. Um, and certainly the, the patterns that I've traditionally seen, like I said, it is changing. It's becoming far more normalized to mm -hmm. not do that, but you still see it, right. You still have, these famous celebrity trainers or in which is, you know, who, who it's like, oh, some movie star talks about how she eats her low and, you know, whatever diet and her trainer tells her never to lift more than three pounds because she'll get bulky. There's still so much of that nonsense out there. And yep. that's presented kind of as, yeah, this, and it, and it works for this one person who's always been in shape. Therefore, and, and so those are the, I think those are the big ones diet wise, training wise, I kind of touched on, I mean, it's more cardio is better. Still a lot of the low intensity because you're fat burning and, you know, avoid heavy weight training. And basically when women do the exact opposite of all of that, Maybe. that's when, I mean, it's, it's, it can be a challenge as a trainer or a coach. And I'm sure you've run into this to get them to do it, right? The whole, the buy-in process is usually the hard part. Yes. As you go, oh, I eat more protein. And they're like, oh, I don't, finding ways where they're like, oh my God, you know, 100 grams of protein is so much. Like, no, exactly. it's really not. It's really yeah. not, right? When you consider that, you know, that much chicken breast is like 20, 25 grams. Like it's, but it sounds like a lot. Yeah. Like, oh, but if I lift, you know, everyone, oh, but I get, I get bulky real fast. Like, yeah, pro you probably don't. Yeah. Statistically speaking, no, you don't. And then they do it. And a month later, they're just like, I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Once, once yeah. you get them to buy in, once they immediately, when they raise protein, their appetite comes under control. Their blood sugar is stable. They start seeing changes in their body along with the weight training and all this other stuff. Then you've converted them. But that, that initial sell is frequently yeah. It's It's funny you mention that because even in the Facebook messenger, sometimes I get women asking me for advice. Uh, the beginning was naive. I just told them, uh, yeah, eat more protein, hit 100 grams. Some of yeah. them did it, and one she's a, she's a climber, and she came back one week, one week after. I don't I don't know, but I'm I'm breaking records. I just changed one one thing you told me, you know. Wow. I, I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think those are really you know sort of the, the the big ones, you know. And I mean, there's other silly weight training. There's still some ideas that like you know, this is a bulking exercise, and this is a toning exercise, and mm -hmm. some of those ideas are still kind of floating around out there. Mm -hmm. You know that to tone, you should do high reps and lighter repetitions, or or, or uh, lighter weights and higher repetitions or whatever it is. There's still some of that. And we'll, we can touch on that a little bit, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but I'd say those are still, you know, those have been the big ones my entire career. Yeah. And yeah. at least within certain circles, within certain subcultures, it is changing. But I fear yeah. that the majority of women, because, you know, as I've pointed out, just go Google weight loss. The amount of terrible information it like through the first three to five pages of Google, it's mm. all terrible yeah, yeah. because these are the companies that have the marketing budgets. And, yeah. and, and this is why I don't, I try not to be critical, right? It's easy to go, oh, you know, why, why are you so dumb? Why don't you know any better? Like, well, yeah. how can you know any better when this is all you've ever seen from everyone your entire life? 
Yes. Right. You cannot expect people to know what they don't know. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that because yesterday I downloaded a magazine called Women's Health. Um, yeah. Another one called Shape, I think. And I just scrolled yes. through and I also saw all the information that fed, you know, it's, it's really hard to resist. And, and make no mistake, men have it too. Men have the bodybuilding magazines where every article contradicts every other article. Oh, yeah. And then women's magazines, you know, have their own set of issues that tends to promote a lot of this. This, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's getting better. You know, in the U.S., we've got these, um, these little women's health, not women's life, these little newspaper magazine things at the checkout at the grocery store. And the cover's always like, new keto hack, lose 27 pounds, you know, 12 kilos in 10 days. And I like, I can't help but read them. I, I have this weird compulsion, maybe because I just want to get angry. Yeah. But although it's not just like, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the secret. And you read it and all it, it all is basically the exact same advice. But like when women are presented nothing or predominantly this amount of information, whether it's from shape, women's health, whatever, or these little new, you know, these little magazines are trying more at the general public. Like, what do you expect? You know, yeah. what do you, it, it doesn't surprise me going a little bit off topic, you know, that, that weight loss statistics are so bad. I realize there's far more to it. And, and I wish I could tell everyone that I could guarantee hundred percent success rates, but I'd be lying. But I have to think that a lot of the reason people fail in the long term at weight loss is because the way people are taught to diet is appalling <laughs> it's yeah. such a ter it's all bad none of it's sustainable none of it's yeah. realistic yeah. of course they're gonna fail so anyway yeah. i would say maybe it's the black and white thinking that people have about dieting they're either doing right or wrong carbs are either good or bad you know big part big part of it and and that's part of you know the diet wars and diet culture and you know saying that you know just don't eat this just don't eat that like i said i used to read endless diet books back when i was younger and that's, that was always the premise. This food makes you fat. If you don't eat it, whether it's carbs, sugar, fats, it doesn't even matter. Or this food makes you lean. Calcium got really big for a while. So as long as you just eat all this, you'll be fine. And on the one hand, simple diets do work better, at least initially, right? Let's say you're a little bit of a nerd about this. I'm a big time nerd about this. Mm -hmm. Giving the average person super complicated sets it's too much. It's too many yeah. choices. It's like what you said. If if the only thing you ever told, the only two things you ever told a female client were this: get enough protein, and challenge yourself in the weight room. Oh, yeah. Everything else is almost completely negotiable. I won't say it's irrelevant, but if you hit those two things, you are like ninety percent ahead of the game. So a lot of these simple diets, right? It's like ah. Uh, do I eat carbs? Can I eat carbs? Should I? Eat? Well, if it just says don't, you know, right? It's just a, a, a what they call a bright line boundary. Mm. These can be very helpful in the early stages. The problem then becomes down the road, because what these typically tell you is, oh, if you don't eat this, you don't have to count calories. You'll lose weight easily and quickly. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, the pro and it does, it works initially, because always these foods have a lot of calories. But down the road, when weight loss starts to slow, fat loss starts to slow, the, all this, and they have a plateau, and you step in and go, okay, you're going to have to start counting calories. And they go, the calories don't count. Now you've run, in, now the problem has reversed itself. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, I'm all for, I'm all for giving people the simplest set of rules that will get them progr progressing, right? The easy, you know. I would rather focus on qualitative changes early on, which I'm a general public, than quantitative changes, right? So I had a client years ago, he was drinking like four regular sodas a day. That's like a thousand calories of sugar water. And I said, just switch to water or diet soda or whatever. And within two weeks, he was losing a pound, you know, about half, three quarters of a kilo a week. With just that one, he didn't have to count calories, just making that one big change. Now, as you get leaner, you have to be a little bit more quantitative in numbers and stuff like that. So I'm not, I'm not against that by any stretch, but with the understanding that it's working by making you eat less. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so, but, but again, in every diet, no matter what it is, will be like, this is, this is the best diet. And anytime someone says, this is the best diet, what it means is, this worked for me. 
And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? If intermittent fasting works for you, great. Yep. I've, I can kind of make it work sometimes and most times not. So it's not for me. Does that mean it's bad? No. If it's a great strategy for you, who am I to say? Yep. If calorie cycling works, if intermittent calorie restriction works for you, if cutting carbs is the only way you can, you know, maintain your calorie intake, if doing a cyclical that we you know you no carbs during the week and high carbs on the weekend, mm -hmm. they all work for some people. They all don't work for other people. And some people are right in the middle. And what I find is that people will hear, okay, this is the diet, no matter what it is. And then if it doesn't work for them, they, I'm a failure. The diet, no, that, I mean, don't get me wrong. People can fail at diets. However, <laughs> diets can fail for people. Yeah. If it is not sustainable for whatever reason, as long as a diet, again, gets enough protein and has a calorie deficit, the rest is kind of, the rest we can argue about. And it yeah. doesn't really matter in the bigger picture. Yeah. It's very context specific. As long as it does that, the only other factor is, will it make you stick to it? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's more, and again, we could have another completely two hour podcast. <laughs> One of my current thoughts, and then I'll, we'll get back to women, you know, people have to realize that eating and dieting is a learning process, is figuring out which sets of strategies, whether it's meal frequency, how you distribute calories through the day, through the week, how you incorporate, you know, treat foods or whatever you want to call them every individual has to kind of figure that out through trial and error. And when you do yeah. that, you're yeah. going to do it. You're going to fail the first couple times. And maybe you decide like, okay, you know, like for me, I can't keep cookies in the house because if I do a bag will be one serving. Yeah. I know my, I know myself. I just don't buy them. Uh -huh. I want cookies. Mm -hmm. I have to get up, go to the grocery store, buy, and I'll buy whatever, you know, if I want X two cookies, I'll buy two cookies and I'll go home. That's just something I've learned the hard way. My, yeah. my mom can keep cookies in the house. Yeah. I'm, when I go home, I eat all her cookies. My point being that for me, that's a non-starter. For me, if I try to intermittent fast and don't eat during the day, and then I get to four and I go, oh, I'm gonna wait a couple more hours. And then I end up at the all you can eat buffet, or I did before all this started. And I would eat far too many calories. It's better for me to eat a few smaller meals. Yeah. Doesn't mean yeah. it, that's best for you. So anyway, a lot of this is figuring out which of these strategies, regardless of the magic diet of the day, right? Because again, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this professionally for 25 years, been obsessed with this field for near 30, since I was about 15. Uh, so 15. 35, 35 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen it all. And if there were a single perfect diet, we would know what it is by now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. because everything has been tried and they all work either about the same, either about as well or about as poorly, depending on how you want to look at it. And I was saying 15 years ago, I was like, what's the best diet? The one you can stick to. Mm -hmm. And now the researchers are like, well, we've compared them all high carb, medium carb, low carb, this carb, that carb, the other carb. And <laughs> uh, over a year, about a kilo difference, if that big picture. And it's like, yeah, and, and make no mistake, there are benefits, you know, in certain cases, lower carbs are absolutely superior. The women that are insulin resistant polycystic ovary syndrome, because it may help with adherence for their general health. I'm not saying they're all equal. I'm saying that if there was one that was the singular, because all successful diets, sufficient protein, create a deficit, sustainable in the long term, so the rest of it is negotiable. Yeah. But that's a whole, we're getting way off topic. Yeah, so let's yeah, get back yeah. to women. I like it though, I like it. Um, so for women that are watching this and uh, that just started losing weight, I think they should just focus on enough protein and going to weight room and not hitting the cardio area too often, I would say. But what, what's actually then, when, when, when would be a good time for women to inform them? Because I know there's a difference, for example, refeed strategy. There are different refeed strategies between men and women. Yeah. So when, when is the point when women should inform themselves about, about these topics? So I, basically all the, you know, so, so my big thing that, and I've been for most of my career is context, right? Context is key. And I think this is something that a lot of coaches and trainers forget. Most mm -hmm. coaches and trainers come from the, let's be, let's just call it what it is. The obsessive, slightly neurotic, 
slightly psychotic. We wanted, like, when I was 15, when I first got into the weight room, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Like, I just it? loved being, right, I just knew, yeah. I knew when I started yeah. riding bikes and got into sports, yeah. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, and we forget that our obsession is probably not the general population's obsession, right? Mm -hmm. So who are we talking, who is my client, right? If you are a physique athlete who's coming to me and going, I have a contest in six months, I am going to have a very different conversation with you than if you are a general female who, of whatever age, who is maybe in you know the high 20s to low 30% body fat, who has struggled with fat loss previously, who has done all the traditional stuff, I am going to give you the least amount of information I can to get you progressing. And we already talked about what those two big factors are, right? And, and, and there's a big push. Um, I know there's a lot of books. Uh, oh, I forget the name. Basically the idea that you, know, you can make a 1% improvement every week over a year or two years, that is life-changing. Focusing mm -hmm. on small habits in, you know, so fine, if, if all I need to tell you is to eat more protein, your energy level's better, performance is better, you feel better, frequently that makes people eat less and that gets your fat loss moving, I'm not gonna care about the rest of it. Not initially. When that stops working, when you start to get to a little bit, you know, as we get leaner, as, we get closer to goal, things start to become a little bit more technical, a little bit more complicated. You have to pay attention a little bit more to the details as you go. Now that said, with women, there is the issue of the menstrual cycle, and this will probably make the good, a good connection to this, mm -hmm. is women's physiology changes throughout the four weeks roughly of her cycle in terms of what fuel she uses, in terms of carbohydrates versus fats, appetite, bunch of different things. And there's been one paper and I really need them, I really want them to follow up on it. And they compared, it was whatever their country's sort of generic diet advice was, which means 15% protein, which is usually too low, 60% carbs and whatever, whatever the fat, whatever that leaves for fat, 25 or 30%, to what they called a menstrual cycle driven diet. And basically they adjusted the diet for the different parts of the cycle. And what was at least, uh, not interesting so much as like, I come very much from a science background from sort of a theory background. I do always enjoy when the stuff, the ideas I come up with do seem to correspond with mm. the real world. Like it's sort of how I check myself. Like mm. all this paper theory is great, but if it isn't what, the, anyway, I'd done all this work and like, okay, how would I set up a diet for this part of the cycle for that? And I came up with all my, my, my conclusions. And then this paper came out, it was basically the exact same thing I'd already come mm. up with. And that was just kind of, kind of reassuring that I wasn't drilling a dry well. And, and what they found was that the, menstrual cycle driven diet, and they changed exercise a little bit, and I'm not gonna get too far into the details, basically got better results because the adherence was better. Oh, wow. And this is sort of, the, this is the thing we'll come, come to when we talk about the menstrual cycle is men are the same every day. We just are, right? If you're a trainer and you train guys, the same guy is walking to the gym every day of the week. I mean, he might be a little more tired or more, but it's the same physiology, the same hormone levels. He is the same, you know, jerk that he that he has been since he hit puberty, right? It just is. With a woman, depending, the woman walking in this week may be not completely different, but different than the woman you trained a week or two weeks ago yep. in terms of her energy level, her appetite, her mood, her coordination. All of these things can change. Now, they, they're highly variable between women. Some women are, have no changes. Some women are night and day. I, I was talking to a therapist one time and um, he, he said, yeah, with, with male patients come in and they're just the same guy I saw a week ago. He goes, but with women, I won't know who I'm treating mm -hmm. until five or 10 minutes into the session. And again, this, none of this, I don't want any women listening to this. This isn't meant to be typical. This isn't a male, uh, women are weak. Women. This is just a statement of fact. Women have these variations that men don't. Most programs try to 
force women's physiology into the program rather than adapting the program to the physiology. And so working with that as far as changing the diet to better match women's physiology was kind of behind, I mean, they gave them more protein too, which is what, I mean, that alone, but they altered carbs and fats during a part of the cycle when we're a little bit more, are often hungrier and have more cravings. They were like, yeah, we allowed a piece of dark chocolate if they wanted it, right? Like if they're gonna have the cravings anyway, if this isn't, like, let's just build it into the program. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about is mm -hmm. it's not, like I said, it better, and same thing with training. If you have a woman whose training performance is up and down and up and down, and you're just going to be like, boom, I'm going to train them the way I train, which is I can go hard every day, every week. That won't work. No, and no. Women do this to themselves mm -hmm. because during, if they have a week where their performance is particularly poor and they have the mindset of, I got to go hard. I got to set a personal best. I got to do more than I did before. And they can't because of their physiology. You can't just power through that, right? You can't just be like, I'm going to, I'm going to will myself through it. And being, and which isn't to say, oh, you know, ah, you came in like not saying give up or make, but if, if the physiology is there and as a coach, you're tracking this, you go, all right, I had a training one time during one week of her cycle she would not be able to lift more than 60% of her best on machines. Her coordination went out the window. She couldn't lift heavy. So once I finally got my head out of my butt and noticed the pattern, I just planned it. I go, okay, for this week, we're going to fool around on machines. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the next week, she'd be ready to set personal records. So mm -hmm. I took her heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once I adapted that, suddenly I started to get, so that's a lot of what this is about is figuring out what pattern is present for any individual woman and then adapting the program to match yeah. her. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I heard from Menno Hanselmans, he, he talked about menstrual cycle periodization. Yes. And he talks about differences between the first two weeks, the follicular phase, and then the yes. menstrual phase. So I think in the follicular phase, they can handle more volume and also more calories. Is it true? Or am I um, Yes. And so like, I think this is a really good uh, place to sort of transition into the basics, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things you said before we got started, it's like from, a, from an outline, what's the big difference between women and men? And really the big one, it is hormones, right? So before puberty, little girls and little boys are mostly identical. There are some slight differences. We have a little bit more body fat. But by and large, they're about the same. Athletic performance is the same. You know, go look at a bunch of five-year-olds. They all look basically the same, mm -hmm. right? And then at puberty, that's where we diverge, right? Women, men's testosterone goes up. They lose body fat, gain muscle mass, body hair, oily skin, all that stuff happens at puberty. Women start menstruating, and the primary hormones are estrogen and progesterone, which I'll talk about. That cycle begins, and it's a little bit, uh, unstable in the first few months. It takes a little while to kind of get, kind of come online completely. At that point, women will gain more body fat, typically moves to the hips and thighs. Breasts will develop, hips widen, bone, you know, bone closure, all that stuff. So really puberty is where it, where it changes, right? And men are easy. Like I said, men's testosterone. I mean, Someone listens to go, oh, I mean, it changes a little during the month and it changes a little during the year, but big picture, these are small changes. Like I said, guy from puberty to death, like testosterone drops with age, but by and large, we're just the same dude every single day. We're yeah. easy. We're yeah. simple from top to bottom, and I mean that. Women have this, the menstrual cycle, which is now what I'm going to describe. So typically... The menstrual cycle we typically think of as being 28 days long. It's not. A, a, a standard menstrual cycle, anywhere from 25 to 32 days. Most women, even if they report being 28 days long, generally aren't. Some women are machines. It is the same length every, without fail. Some women, it will vary. It might be longer one month, shorter one month, you know, a little bit more unpredictable things like diet and training stress can affect those things sometimes. And there's, and this is just a good example. Women's reproductive systems can be thrown off by the smallest stressors. Like it just takes so little 
to cause a woman's re reproductive system to, to have problems. Men, <laughs> not so much, right? It takes so much work to really get a man, unless he's got something genetic. Like it takes a lot, like men's system, like I said, we are simpler from top to bottom. Um, okay, so I'm gonna work from a 28 day cycle just for convenience, just realize that it's not always 28 days. So we divide that into two 14 day cycles, right? Ovulation is in the middle. That's when the egg, the egg is released, all right. Day one of the cycle is defined as the first day of menstruation. That's just, that's how they standardize it, right? So that's day one. The first two weeks of the cycle are called the follicular phase. This is when the follicle is developing. The follicle is what has the egg for pregnancy. Hormonally, estrogen starts very low, starts to sweep up. About three days before ovulation, there's a big spike and then it drops. Progesterone, the other female hormone, basically stays low the whole time. So during that first half of the cycle, estrogen is the dominant hormone and that's causing the follicle to develop. At ovulation, the follicle explodes. And that is the terminology they use. And I just find that I'm just imagining because <laughs> yeah. I'm weird. The <laughs> egg is released. What's left of the follicle will implant and form what's called the corpus luteum, which starts producing progesterone. So then in the second half of the cycle, so again, here's ovulation. The second half of the cycle is called the luteal phase, right? Corpus luteum, luteal phase. Estrogen has dropped very low and then will come back up to about half of where it was in the first two weeks. Progesterone, which was very low, will sweep up. So here, here's estrogen, here's progesterone. It's about day 21 and then they'll drop back down. And that fourth week of the cycle is typically when a woman will experience premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual tension, depending on what it's called. Uh, where you live, uh, typically that's when those, that will occur. It, it can, you can get a few days earlier on, every woman is a little bit different, but typically speaking, right? So again, 28 day cycle, split in the middle by ovulation. Menstruation, estrogen goes up, peaks, drops, and then comes back up and down. Progesterone starts low, comes up and down. In the strictest sense, a woman's physiology is probably changing a little bit every week. That gets even too complicated for me. <laughs> yeah. So it's usually easiest to just talk about the first half of the cycle, the follicular phase, and the second half of the cycle. And so the first half of the cycle is the easy one. Estrogen is the dominant hormone. Now estrogen gets blamed for a lot, but really most of what estrogen does is very positive. Estrogen helps control appetite and hunger. And actually the few days right before ovulation is women are typically the least hungry. Uh, estrogen helps with skeletal muscle remodeling. It decreases inflammation. It improves insulin sensitivity, which means women handle carbohydrates better. Mm -hmm. um, it actually inhibits, it, it stimulates fat burning in the muscle. Mm -hmm. It is involved in lower body hip and thigh. That gets really complicated. It is involved, but it is not really the direct issue. It is sort of an indirect factor. So estrogen's effect's really good. And that's where this idea of menstrual cycle periodization comes from. And I'll come back to that, about training volume. So in the second half of the luteal phase, even though, so again, here's progesterone and here's estrogen. Progesterone is higher. I still see resources, both in the research world and referring to that as a high estrogen state, but it's not. It's a high progesterone state or a high hormone state. The thing is, progesterone does two things. One, it basically has the exact opposite effects of estrogen. Uh, hunger and appetite and cravings tend to go up in the second half of the cycle. Uh, progesterone stimulates protein breakdown in the muscle to a slight amount. Keeps, you know, muscle doesn't adapt as well. Doesn't reduce inflammation causes insulin resistance. So women don't handle carbohydrates as well. Women often find the second half of the cycle that blood sugar gets more unstable, mm -hmm. which can drive cravings and hunger and affect energy levels and mood. The progesterone also blocks the effects of estrogen. So it's kind of a double whammy. 
So not only does progesterone do the opposite thing, also progesterone directly stimulates fat storage in the hips and thighs. Mm -hmm. Progesterone is really the bad guy in a fat loss sense. Yeah. Like make no mistake, it is important in a physiological sense. Eliminating it would not be a good thing for women. But of the two hormones, estrogen gets the blame. Pro progesterone is really the problem in as much as there is a problem. So that, like I said, so that's kind of the overall level. Appetites controlled the best in the first two weeks. Hunger and cravings tend to be a little bit higher in weeks three and four for a number of reasons. Now, metabolism is up slightly in weeks three and four. Body temperature goes up a little bit, but the, the difference is small. Women may burn an extra one to 300 calories a day for the first, during the second half of the cycle, but if it's uncontrolled, food intake can go up by 500 calories a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and if you mm -hmm. think about this in a biological sense, right? I'll come back to fat loss, right? What we have to remember is that this entire thing is aimed at pregnancy, right? Your body fundamentally doesn't care <laughs> about what you want to look like or appearance or yeah. it's geared towards pregnancy. So the first half of the cycle, we're sort of, get, menstruation is, is sort of, uh, getting rid of everything made from the previous cycle. That's what men's, menstruation is just, it's the body expelling the intermetrial tissue that wasn't necessary, right? Follicle develops, the egg is dropped at ovulation. Now something else that occurs at ovulation, there's a little spike in testosterone. Not big, but in women, small changes in testosterone are pretty big, mm -hmm. comparatively speaking. And that is probably to increase sex drive, I had to guess, because that is when women are most fertile, those couple of three days right around ovulation. After ovulation, progesterone is up, appetite is up, because in the, if a woman becomes pregnant, her body mm. will, wants to start storing calories in the hips and thighs to support pregnancy and childbirth, if it occurs. Then if it doesn't, all the hormones drop. The endometrium, which was developed for pregnancy is expelled in menstruation and starts all over again. Yeah, yeah. So would it make so, sense? Sorry, you're gone. No, no, go ahead. Uh, would it make sense then to have a bigger calorie deficit in the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle when hunger is low? Uh, yes, and actually this is something, I think I'm the only one who's ever even mentioned it because I found some paper, right? Because I am insane. <laughs> when I do, no, I'm like, I don't say that as a bad thing. It's like, I'm obsessive and a little bit crazy. Well, I like, I don't know if I'm crazy because I am this obsessive or whichever, but in a paper, and it talked about that, that during the first two weeks of the cycle as women's energy levels will be most stable, appetite is best controlled. They said, look, if a woman is going to start a new fat loss plan, that's when she should do it because it gives her the most likely chance of success. Right, mm -hmm. to get because if you start in the set, I'm not saying it can't be done in weeks three and four, but it's going to be harder. Right, a time when you've got cravings for it, it could be it's interesting. There's a very big cultural issue. The two most craved foods are either sugary foods or savory foods like chicken. Like in America, it's chocolate because little girls are taught by their moms, ah, chocolate will make you feel better. In Spain, they, they crave chicken during the second half of the cycle. Mm -hmm. It's it's totally, it is what you're taught as a, as a little girl, basically. And so starting the second week of the cycle when cravings and hunger off the map, can it be done? Sure, but good luck getting a couple weeks of good, you know, positive success and reward. And especially for the general public, that's critical. They yeah. need a good, co you know, for women who've had lots of previous diet failures, starting them in the first two weeks of the cycle is giving them the greatest chance of succeeding for the first two weeks. Yep. So yeah, there is, there is some logic to probably baking things a little bit stricter if you want to, because appetite is, is more well controlled. By a similar token, so in the second half of the cycle, there are two ways to look at this calorie increase, right? This, this little bit of increased metabolic rate, energy expenditure for metabolic rate. One, is you can keep calories under control and lose a little bit more fat. I mean, 200 calories over 10 to 14 days, that's almost, I mean, that's almost two thirds a pound of fat. Like it, that's not insignificant. Or you can go, well, since hunger and cravings are going to be up, let's allow a couple hundred extra calories or let's allow them 
if you need them. That was what that menstrualine study did. They were like, yeah. Now again, when I say have a piece of dark chocolate, I don't mean eat a bag. They mm -hmm. were like, they, I think they allowed them, it was like a 200 gram piece if they needed it or wanted it. I don't have, I don't have a first concept of how much candy that is. It's like whatever, it's one, it's just whatever it needs to take the edge off. So there are a couple way, different ways to look at that. But yeah, certainly starting the diet in the first half of the cycle um, there's even been data, and I'm not really up to it, that for women, where, where in the cycle they are to start like trying to quit smoking or drinking or drugs, even that can affect success rates. Mm. But I haven't looked at it enough to tell you. So, so this matters, right? It, this, mm -hmm. this is an, an aspect that needs to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. So far as the training periodization, what the studies kind of did is they were like, all right, we either put a lot of volume in the first two weeks, like five days a week, trying the same muscle groups, and once a week in the luteal phase, so two day, twice in 14 days, or we flipped it, and then one study split them up all the way through. And what they found was that, that putting more training in the follicular phase, the first half of the cycle, gave better gains than putting it in the second half. And physiologically, this makes sense. Now, I'm not saying they didn't get any gains in the second half. They got more. And again, pretty simple program. You know, it's like leg press and leg curl, three sets each daily, I think. Um, and that even, and actually the follicular phase training did better than the distributed training, right? That did three sessions across four weeks, whatever it was. And um, so, yeah, there is certainly some logic to that. Um, not all studies agree. And it is interesting, all the studies that showed that that works were in the lower body and women's upper and lower body muscles do respond, like there are differences there that we can come back to if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so absolutely. So other aspects of diet, one, we talked about calories. You, women may be able to tolerate a slightly bigger deficit in the first two weeks and either need to ease up on the deficit or even possibly allow a couple hundred more calories, again, if they need it for adherence or whatever. As I said, in the first half of the cycle, women are more insulin sensitive, which means their bodies handle carbohydrates better. So they can tolerate a little bit higher carbs, a little bit hot, lower fat. During the second half, when typically when the body is insulin resistant, meaning that that hormone doesn't work as well, typically lowering carbs a little bit, increasing fat a little bit helps. Now, we're not talking huge differences. We're talking about 10% either way. For the average woman listening to this, you might not even want to worry about it. Yeah. Especially because the way we typically, well, the way that more athletically oriented fat loss is set up, Carbs are always pretty moderate to begin with, right? By the time you hit protein at whatever it is, 1.5 to 2 grams per kilo, fat at, you know, 0.5 grams per kilo, carbs can never be that high to begin with, right? And I think that's a lot of why, and we'll, I'll talk about the physiology of why this works so well for women. It, so like, there's not, a, like you don't have to make a huge change. If you got most women to just higher protein, moderate fat and moderate carbs, that'll probably work across the cycle. So realize that, yeah, if your hunger's higher during the second half on a day and you need a little bit of a, tr have it. You got a couple hundred calories to play with. Better to do that then, than mm -hmm. to feel deprived or lose control or whatever. Yep. Now there is that fourth week, that late luteal phase, that's typically when premenstrual syndrome is going to occur, if it's going to occur. And it's only, I think it's something like 30% of women experience it. Lot, most women experience cramps to some degree. Um, a small percentage of women experience what's called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is like PMS to the hundredth power, right? Because PMS symptoms can include cramping, low blood sugar, what they call in the research, emotional lability, which is a really sciencey way of basically saying there can be mood swings. And again, mm -hmm. this is women, this is not me going, ah, you know, women are crazy. This is biologically driven. Coordination may be impaired, um, lots of things. But in premenstrual dysphoric disorder, women may be incapacitated by pain. Some yeah. will suffer suicidal thoughts. 
it, I mean, uh, a nurse practitioner I know who deals with certain, with mental illness, for some of her female patients, she puts them on an antidepressant just for week four because they get so far down, right? Now that is a small percentage, but to say that is dismissive to the women that experience it because if you experience it, that is your experience and it can be horrific, right? I mean, again, we're talking about can't get out of bed because you're in so much pain. Yeah. Now let's think about both in terms of diet. I mean, there's a dietary heritage issue, good luck. But what if you're trying to train, <laughs> right? Even if you can get to the gym, which may or may not be, you know, that's one of the, the more entertaining things you'll read is that, ah, exercise is one of the best things to help with PMS. Sure. And if you're so debilitated by PMS, good luck getting out to exercise, right? Like good luck when you feel, when, when you are in so much cramp pain that you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So good advice, not always the best to follow. Um, cramps can be dealt with actually with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, I know what we call them in the US, but that wouldn't mean anything to anybody else. But it just, a percentage of women, it doesn't help, but even that just helps to deal with yeah. what, what cramping is is it's the muscles breaking up the endometrium so it can be expelled uh, during menstruation. And so that, but that can be very physically painful. But yeah, so if you're a coach, right, your female trainee comes in and is in this week and you're like, all right, gonna hit it hard. You're gonna do a lot of metabolic conditioning, gonna mat, you know, do some heavy, heavy fives in the squat. Maybe not the best idea because you are setting someone up for complete failure. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you may be ex someone with no motivation with that. You just got to get them through the workout. Um, or that's when, you know, frequently personal trainers and coaches are therapists as much as we are anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least that was certainly the case. And, you know, maybe, maybe it is, that's when you light recovery workout. That's when you just do something yeah. to, to make, you know, or some people may need a complete week off depending on how deep yeah. they are on it. Yeah. Um, and, and performance can vary throughout the rest of the cycle. If you read the research, it says that A, world records have been set in any phase of, in all phases of the cycle. And that's true. But a lot of this early research relied on women reporting where they were in their mm -hmm. cycle. And that's mm -hmm. completely inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, it's very hard to tell. Like the only, the only real point you can know is menstruation. Some women swear they can feel the egg being released and I believe them. But and then you look at the research and they go, eh, there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. A lot of this research is terrible. Usually they're looking at aerobic exercise and usually continuous endurance activity. Now, as an endurance athlete, I don't know if you're ever an endurance athlete, when you're an endurance athlete grinding miles, if you're a little tired, you can still do it, right? You can, uh, you can always go out on the bike and ride for 30 miles, even if you feel a little, little rough. Now, try doing 90 second sprint intervals. Now, try doing maximum triples in the squat. Now, we're, and, and, and the way I conceptualize it, right? If you're an endurance athlete and you're riding at 70%, here's 100%. If it comes down to 90, eh, it's a little harder, but you can do it, right? If you're a power lifter or an Olympic lifter or even a bodybuilder going very heavily and you're lifting at 90%, if 100 for triples, three reps, if 100% comes to 95%, this is now 95%. If 100 comes to 90%, that workout can't be completed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this research, and again, there's huge, huge variability. I've had female trainees that were flat line. I had the one female trainee I mentioned to you, she'd be set PRs in week one, be a little weaker in week two, a little stronger in week three, and I had to have her play on machines in week four. So as much as I can speak to generalities, every woman listening to this has to be her own best son or, their, or her coach or both. Keep records yeah. for an entire month. Just do the same workout every, the same workout each week. And just note, rating of perceived exertion. How did I feel? My motivation. You will start to discern patterns. And then you can adjust the training. If you know that during the final week, the performance isn't there. Expecting yourself to go in and perform at 100% is setting yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plan it, make yeah. it a light week. Most athletes train like that anyway, right? You train hard for three weeks, take an easy week, you come back and a couple days after menstruation, you'll be ready to blow it out of the water. 
Yeah. So set it up to work with your physiology. Yeah, yeah. So those are some of the, you know, some other things to consider diet wise um, other than what I already talked about. Well, let me back up. One thing women need to be aware of, and this gets to fat loss and weight loss, changes in body weight throughout the menstrual cycle. Because there are a couple of key places where water retention tends to occur. Typically body weight will be lowest day two or three of the first week. Right? And we all know if you weigh yourself four times, what's the real weight? The lowest value, because of course it is, right? Right before ovulation, body weight frequently will go up slightly. Yeah. And it can vary. Women vary enormously in this. And it is water weight. What's happening is that estrogen is affecting how the body holds on to sodium and that holds on to water. Typically will drop again in the first half in the first week of the luteal phase. Because progesterone, as much as I talked about it being bad does tend to cause water loss. It does tend to clear up the skin for women that have issues with oily skin or acne because of how it works. And then if body weight's really gonna go up, it'll be that fourth week of the cycle, right? PMS week tends to be the worst for body weight spikes. Yeah. And the women who've experienced this listening to this, like, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about, you know, ankles are puffy, calves are like everything, like you can, you press into the skin and it just stay, you know, you press into it and it just ever so slowly. And it can be, you know, two or three kilos. It depends on the woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this is it can make tracking progress extremely difficult. Because let's say a woman is on a fairly moderate diet, losing half kilo a week, maybe three quarters if she's lucky. If in week two of the cycle, your body weight spikes by a kilo, it will look like your diet's not working, right? You'll yeah. be doing everything right and get on the scale and go, my trainer's an idiot. This isn't working. And then in week three, it'll drop. And then in week four, be like, now I'm a kilo and a half heavier. What's going on? Yeah. And because of that, what women, what you can't do, well, A, first you should establish your own pattern as a woman. But two is if you are aiming for fat loss, you can't compare weeks of the cycle to one another, right? You can't compare week two to week one or week, and you know what, honestly, week four, you might just want to not track anything. <laughs> really, really nothing good can usually come of it, yeah. right? And I mean, and again, this sound like I'm, I'm American, so I'm a little bit obnoxious, but like I'm making jokes about this not to be critical or dismissive. I've known hardcore physique athletes that knew about all of this and they still get crazy when their scale weight goes up. It's just part of the diet. Men do it too, but men don't tend to have the same issues like this. Yes. Uh -huh. What you have to do is compare week one to week one, week two to week two, week three to week three, and then if you measure week four to week four. Yeah. Because the pattern you might see, and these are just completely picked out of the, the blue numbers. Like let's say your weight in week one, it's called 60 kilos. Week two, body weight's up, let's call it 62 kilos, up to. Week three, 61 kilos, split the middle. And then week four, let's call it 65 kilos just to make the number, right? So we went 60, 62, 61, 65, just due to water. So, been dieting, let's say you're down two kilos. You would expect week one to drop from 60 to 58. And that's probably, again, the most accurate. But week two, what you would hope to see would be for it to drop from 62 to 60, right? So it's still heavier than week one, but it's two kilos down relative to itself. Week three, should go from 61 to 59. It's the same thing. It's different than week one and week two, but it is down two kilos relative to its starting point. And again, week four, if you decide to track, I would hope 65 to go to 63. And again, yeah. it's not that weight, body weight can be affected by so many things, water, food in the gut, mm -hmm. sodium, stress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just trying to make that pattern clear. You have to compare like weeks. And like I said, I think week one is probably going to be the most accurate. But what I was going to say is during weeks two and weeks four, what's happening is that the body is holding sodium more strongly. 
That's what causes the water retention. One of the things I recommend in the book is if you bump your potassium intake up and try to control your sodium intake, that will help to offset a lot of this water retention. Um, I don't know if y'all, you know, again, I, I tend to be very America centric and forget that all the crazy stuff we have. Uh, we have something called light salt and it's half, so, it's half sodium chloride and half potassium chloride. Mm -hmm. I recommend that. And you can also find one that I think is one third sodium and two thirds potassium. Yeah. Using that is a really good way to bump potassium intake because it tends to be very deficient in the diets. Uh, do not get straight potassium chloride. It tastes like metal. They, they make a straight <laughs> potassium chloride salt for food. It's vile. Yeah. Um, it, it tastes like aluminum. Um, so yeah, that can help with the water retention, but mainly just being aware of it. And this can affect the performance too, depending on the activity. Right? For certain endurance activities, if you're a runner, if you're a cyclist, one or two kilo difference in body weight makes a huge difference climbing hills, yeah. running up hills, right? If you are trying to do body weight exercises, chin-ups, dips, push up, whatever it is, suddenly you'll go from being, I can do, like men do it too. Like if a guy's body weight is up by a couple kilos, his pull-up chin-up performance will just drop like a stone. <laughs> it makes a humongous difference. Yeah. So yeah. The, again, these are things to be aware of in terms of tracking things, just be, and that to me, like we can only do so much about them. If you are a woman and your body weight spikes in week four, it spikes in week four. That is part of you. We can't fix it, although this will move into birth control, which in a way can, but we can A, be aware of it and B, just try to at least work with it. If you mm -hmm. know that your body weight's mm -hmm. gonna be up and getting on the scales is gonna drive you crazy, just wait. Right, just like I said, nothing good can usually come yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that that's just kind of like you know that the overview of that, um, and, and it's important to understand that on some level because that sort of acts as a base for everything else that can happen physiologically to a woman. Um, I don't know if you've got any other questions about the menstrual cycle. This is the time where I can sort of move into birth control. No, no, I actually wanted to say let's make a bridge uh, towards birth control. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If the menstrual cycle was complicated, birth control is a nightmare. <laughs> it took me months to wrap my head around it because there's so many different kinds and they all work a little bit differently. So the first form of birth control was the pill, right? Oral birth control, still very commonly used. There are two types of oral birth control. One is called a combined form, and that has a synthetic form of estrogen and a synthetic form of progesterone, called a progestin. It's not used very much anymore. There's a progestin-only oral birth control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not very effective. Some women don't tolerate estrogen very well, and they use that. There is no such thing as an estrogen-only birth control. They do use that in some cases, like after a, a hysterectomy, they may use estrogen, but from, for, for hormonal birth control, it's either combined or progestin only. Traditionally, the synthetic estrogen is something called ethanyl estradiol. Lately, well, there's one form now that's using a bioidentical form of estrogen. This is kind of I don't know about anywhere else in the world, but in the US, right, people kind of went crazy over bioidenticals. The data is very sparse right now. At the very least, they work just as well. In, there's some indication that they may work a little bit better in some ways. My prediction, down the road, I mean, there's a certain logic to it, right? I would expect, I would expect a bioidentical form, basically to be giving women the form of estrogen that their body produces to work better than a synthetic. Like, I don't like the appeal to native, like I don't, but I'm just saying like, because it's clear that ethanyl estradiol does things in a woman's body that estradiol, her own form taken orally does not. But it's only now, 10 years from now, everything I say will probably be wrong because they'll have changed it completely. All right, so, Ethanyl estradiol, that's pretty constant. And dosing, 
varies from 15 to 25 micrograms. Back in the day, they gave enormous amounts. Like in the 70s, like 150 micrograms. <laughs> now they try to give the smallest dose that's effective without causing some minor health risk. The progestin, the synthetic progesterone is where it gets complicated because there are four different generations of progestins based on when they were developed in time. They all work a little bit differently, right? So generation one, it, based on what they were made from, progesterone is a super complicated hormone because it affects four different, it acts like four different hormones in the body. It acts like progesterone, acts a little bit like testosterone, acts a little bit like cortisol, and it acts a little bit like, uh, oh God, aldosterone. So it can affect all these different hormone levels. But the synthetics often work the opposite of how a woman's natural progesterone works. Mm -hmm. So an example, and this is really, I think, the important one. A woman's natural progesterone has what are called anti-androgenic signaling. Now, androgenic, those are like the masculinizing, facial hair, oily skin, acne, deeper voice, right? Those are the, the this is what's called androgenic effects. Progesterone inhibits those, which is why when it goes up in the second half of the cycle, women's skin clears up, right? Now, early forms of birth control, the synthetic progestin was androgenic, meanting it sent a signal similar to testosterone. And if you look, talk to older women that took the pill early on, water retention, mm -hmm. acne, oily skin, it caused all the negatives because the synthetic form was acting differently. And, what, and over the years, they've tried to develop newer synthetic progestins that have the same effectiveness for preventing pregnancy, but with less side effects. And there are like eight different progesterones, progestins across four different generations. The first three all have somewhat androgenic effects, but they vary. The fourth generation are anti-androgenic. They're finally getting closer to synthetic a synthetic form of one's own progesterone. Yasmin, Yaz, it's, it's commonly called drospirinone. Actually, women love it. It causes a little bit of weight loss, clears up their skin, clears up their acne. Um, okay, so that's combined versus progestin only. Oral birth control, you can also, they vary in, in, in how long you take them, right? Typically, you would take three weeks on, and then have a withdrawal week, right? And that's part of why Tom at the Dutch cycle of 28 days, birth mm -hmm. control is, is set on a 28 day cycle. And here's some trivia. I learned about this fairly recently. The whole idea, because during the withdrawal week, the week off, women will bleed, have like a withdrawal bleed. It's not quite the same as menstruation. It's just, it, it happens. The only reason that they've done that is because in the 50s when they were developing this, Researchers felt that women would be more comfortable if they bled mm. every month. No joke. There is no science to this. It was simply, I mean, they were introducing a drug that was completely new, right, to a, a population that this was completely foreign to. So I understand why. However, in 2020, one research paper I read basically said that the, the withdrawal week should be consigned to history because there's no reason for it. It decreases the efficacy of the birth control. It causes its own set of problems. There's other forms that were used 24-4, 26-2. But what they started doing recently is they just keep women on continuously because again, the withdrawal week, there's no real reason for it other than 70 years of tradition, 60 years of tradition. So there's, that's one, but then there's a third aspect. <laughs> Told you this is complicated is there are four different types in the sense of that it's called monophasic, biphasic or diphasic, triphasic, quadrophasic. And this refers to how the hormone levels are varied throughout the pill cycle. Monophasic, they're just kept flat. Diphasic, the synthetic estrogen is kept flat, progesterone goes up. Triphasic, can you imagine what this is? Progestin goes up three times. And what they're trying to do is kind of mimic that menstrual cycle I drew out. Progestin mm -hmm. starts low, mm -hmm. goes up a little bit, peaks and comes back down. There's a quadrophasic. Nobody seems to know anything about it. I don't think it's in practice. Mm -hmm. Diphasic isn't used very much. So that's oral birth control. <laughs> Combined can be one of eight progestins used on a cycle length from 21 days to continuously. 
monophasic dot. I told you this is nuts, yeah, like the whole yeah. thing. And that's just oral. Yeah. Okay, so because of some of the issues with oral birth control, because it has, it's a pain. You have to take it the same time every day. What if you forget your pills? Own sets of issues, oral intake of ethanol estradiol causes some things. They try to develop forms that were just as effective, but more convenient. So one is the patch, it's a transdermal patch, slap it on skin. Um, it is progestin only, I believe. Change it out every week, three weeks on, one week off. I don't know if they use that continuously. So again, now we've gone from having to take a pill every day to just slap a patch on once a week. There is the cervical ring, which is a little plastic ring. It's actually inserted. Same thing, it releases hormones locally. Change it out every week, I think. Three weeks on, one week off. Don't know if use it continuously. There is what's called implanon, or neck, I think it's implanon now. It's a little plastic piece that is actually put in the back of the tricep. It releases hormones, mm -hmm. a, a low-dose progestin, synthetic progestin, for three years straight. Minor surgery to put in and take out. There is the Depo Provera shot, right? It is an injection in the back of the arm once every three months. I think it should be taken off the market and I'll mm. explain why in a second. It mm. is nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. It is convenient, it is easy, it is 70 years old and they need to come up with something better. Finally, there is the hormonal IUD, but an IUD is an intrauterine device, a little T-shaped copper piece. They insert and it goes in the fallopian tubes. It is a barrier method, but the hormonal IUD releases hormones just locally to basically prevent pregnancy. And it works very differently than the rest. All the others, the pill, the patch, the ring, the shot, the implant, release hormones into the bloodstream. So they will all have an impact on a woman's menstrual cycle, basically making it kind of disappear. The mm -hmm. hormonal IUD does not. It is totally local. So it acts very, very, very differently than everything else. I'm just I'm curious, can I ask you something really quick? Mm -hmm. Because I know that estrogen has most, I think, anabolic properties and progesterone, like more like catabolic, right? So I think birth control yes, is very pretty, much so. yeah, pretty bad for your, for your gains, right? If you take it like all the time for most of this. It's, that's a really hard question to answer. I, I wrote a little booklet earlier this year, maybe late last year, called Birth Control and Athletic Performance. Because the, the training volume of this book is gonna take me so long to write. I'm like, I need to get this information out there. The impact of birth control and performance is even harder to figure out than the menstrual cycle, mainly because the research is mostly garbage. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, I'm not just saying that to be nitpicky. One of the review papers I read looked at 10 studies on birth control and strength performance and said that they were all terrible. Like it even said these are all low quality trials. Because so one of the things they'll do in these studies, they'll get 10 women who are on four different kinds of birth control and they'll just stick them all together. They'll lose you. Uh, do you hear me? Good, go back. Okay, you, you froze for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you froze for a second. And that's just, they're all gonna work a little bit differently. So you can't do that. The good mm -hmm. studies will at least recruit 10 women and put them on the same form of birth control. And the studies on muscle gains are just all over the map. One, because it depends on the synthetic form of progestin, especially. But one study was like, no, it's the dose of estrogen. A lot of this is that estrogen, the synthetic estrogen tends to cause a little bit of water retention. And I'll talk about the weight gain, fat loss, weight loss thing that shows up as lean body mass. So it's like another paper that just came out said that it might help. It's just, mm -hmm. it's hard, it's really hard for me to tell. My general feeling for, for a diff, slightly different reason is I don't, well, also any effect it has on muscle gains are very small. One of the earliest papers took women eight weeks of training and the training group gained, let's say a kilo and a half of muscle. The birth control group, initially and they, when they combined them all, they were like, ah, they got no gains. But then they split them up and they were like, all right, one group gained about a kilo. The other group didn't based on what form it was. It's like, okay, well, that's half a kilo of muscle gain. And again, who are we talking to? Am I talking to an elite power lifter for whom every gram of muscle counts? Am I talking to the general fitness trainee who doesn't care? 
right now, anecdote, and there's one other thing, and I, I can sweep back to this. One thing that's often underappreciated about birth control is it reduces women's testosterone by about 50%. Mm -hmm. And that to me, now people go, oh, but it's already so low. Well, yeah, but even so, cutting it in half cannot possibly help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of women, again, high level power lifters, one of whom was put on depo. She lost a year of productive training. Another one went off birth control, her testosterone levels tripled tripled and she gained she put like 30 kilograms on her powerlifting total in a year which doesn't sound like much but this is like a 50 kilo female so that to me is almost like does synthetic estrogen have the same anabolic effect as a woman's natural estrogen maybe maybe not the progestin is the issue well like i said the progestins are very different some of them have a mild effect at the androgen receptor mm -hmm. The one that I would, would will definitely cause a problem that drospirinone, that fourth generation, it is antiandrogenic. It works just like a woman. It will bind to the receptor and prevent testosterone from sending a mm -hmm. signal. So that would by by far and away be the worst. The other two, um, it's hard to tell. Like, yeah. my general feeling, I'm trying to think what I said in the book, is that if women had to pick one, the second generation progestin is probably the least. Debt. But again, research should come out tomorrow that says yeah. this is all wrong. Yeah. It, the data set is just so bad. It's really hard for me to say. Mm -hmm. Again, you gotta wonder who we talking to because birth control does have benefits for athletes as long as, as well as drawbacks. And most of it also is on oral birth control. Nobody's done research on the patch, the ring, yeah. any of this other stuff mm -hmm. to have any mm -hmm. clue what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about Depo just kind of so I can stop talking about it. <laughs> Depo is horrible. Depo has, it causes insulin resistance, can cause bone mineral density loss. It causes the highest average weight gain of any of the, or of any of the birth controls. It doubles the risk of obesity for some women, especially if they're already carrying excess Crazy. body fat. Uh -huh. Because what it is, is it is a, super highly high potency first generation progestin. It is like the nastiest progestin you could put in at extremely high doses for yeah. three years. Yeah. I don't understand why 70 years later, they have not developed anything better. I don't, I don't get this. The only thing I can figure is some lab produced a billion tons of it in 1970 and they haven't run out I just don't understand. But even the OBGYNs I know are like, yeah, the stuff's terrible. Um, and when women go off it, it takes like a year for everything to get back to normal. Again, its main benefit is convenience. It's fire and forget. Yeah. Boom, yeah. one shot every three months. Yeah. And I get that, but it's, it's just nasty. And not everyone gets that, but it's a nasty, nasty, nasty drug. So, so far as the others said on performance. So on the one hand, some data suggest, and again, this is all oral birth control now. Can't really speak to the rest of it yet. The pattern that shows up is monophasic birth control. It maintains low levels of both. Generally doesn't have a big effect. The triphasic has a negative effect. And we would expect this because it's got the highest dose of the synthetic progesterone. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But again, we look at the magnitude. It's like, ah, Aerobic performance is 5% loss. Does this matter to the general public? No. no. Does yeah. it matter to an Olympic runner? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's some evidence that it may, I talked about this all in that little booklet, you know, that it, can it impair adaptations to training? And there is, depending, it might. It, it's, like I said, the data is really, really bad right now. Yeah. Like, I would have said these, I get it. I get that research in the 90s and 2000s, nobody knew anything about anything. I get that. Yeah. In 2020, when I see these studies, I just want to write the researchers nasty notes and go, are you guys all just this clueless that you cannot figure, you cannot take 10, 10 like 50% of women are on birth control. And you're telling me you can't find 10 women on the same yeah. kind yeah. to put in a single group. I don't get it. Yeah. So, so there are potential negatives, although how potentially negative they are depends on context. Actually, I guess, let me talk the weight, the weight and fat gain thing real quickly, because that is a potential negative. Mm -hmm. There is a long-held belief 
that birth control causes weight and fat gain. Now, much of this goes back to the 70s when, like I said, the doses were enormous. Progestins were very, very potent. And the research on the topic shows that in general, the average weight gain from birth control is about a kilo to a kilo and a half. Now, it's very easy as a male to say, oh, it's only a kilo to a kilo and a half. But that is extremely dismissive because it's still, it is. Couple things. One, some of it is water, it causes water retention. Um, because when they, when they take it, women off of it, it goes right away. However, the third, the, the triphasic progestin, the triphasic oral birth control does cause fat gain, couple, about a kilo and a half of fat gain and a kilo and a half of muscle loss over three months. Again, high dose, the, the theme here, high dose synthetic progestins, not a good thing. Yeah. Right? Depo-Provera, the triphasic birth control is always the worst of them. However, when you look at the general public studies, right, and this is again a problem with research. If I take 20 women and I give them something and, sorry, let's say 15 women, five get one response, five get a middle response, and five get a high response. And I average them together, I'll go, oh, there's a zero effect. Mm. But that ignores the individual. Yeah. And several studies have done some really interesting things. I realize this is the general public. And they looked at like different, you know, the pill, the patch, the hormonal IUD versus the copper IUD, non-hormonal birth control, over like a year. And they find that, okay, weight gain, average weight gain was, you know, a couple kilos, whatever. But a couple of them showed the ranges. And in one paper, I remember very vividly in one of the hormonal birth control groups, one woman lost 16 kilos in a year. And another woman gained 32 kilos in a year. The range is like plus or minus. But again, when you average them, you ignore, you lose this. But here's where it gets interesting. In one of the papers that looked at a non-hormonal birth control, they saw the same change. So this suggests that it's not the birth control so much as other variables mm -hmm. and that birth control gets the blame. Now, again, I'm not being dismissive. I'm not saying birth control can impact this. Depo-Provera, for example, causes, because of what it does to brain chemistry, makes women more attentive to tastier food. It's like what happens in the second half of the menstrual, basically in the second half of their menstrual cycle for three straight years. Mm. They get carbon fat cravings. Of course, I mean, that's part of how it causes weight gain. Yeah. Yep. But this is suggest that, and also there's an age thing, right? Typically we gain weight as we get up. So it's some, some physicians believe that like one in four women are prone to weight gain on birth control, like true fat gain. But the range, when the range is that big, it, it suggests lifestyle. And kind of in that vein, they've done a couple of studies where they gave female athletes birth control and followed them for like a year. And one of them, the birth control group gained like a quarter kilo more lean body mass um, over a year as runners. And the other group, it was no change. And presumably athletes are the ones controlling their activity, controlling their food intake. So I suspect that the, the big variable weight gains, but again, could birth control be impacting on food intake? Could it be impacting on activity? Absolutely. So in a sense, that is the birth control's fault, but in another sense, isn't I know those stems kind of come up, but I think I hope people get what I'm getting at. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be any other than depo, a major direct. It's just this huge variability that. Mm -hmm. does. And I've talked to physique coaches, um, you know, who are like, yeah, I've had athletes on birth control. They have no trouble getting contest lean. Um, there was a paper that came out I cited in the women's book, and they followed like 26 figure fitness athletes, and like half of them were on birth control, and they all got to where they needed to be. So it unless it's directly impacting on a woman's ability to you know, control her food intake or activity, it doesn't seem to have a big effect in most. Um, like I said, the water gain is there. And again, does it matter? It can certainly, you know, if you're training a female runner, oral birth control, that two, that kilo water gain, is, that's performance destroying. But let's look at the positives. 
So one of them, obviously, from birth control is to prevent pregnancy. And for female athletes, this is important, right? Or if a woman is not looking to become pregnant, right? It's, it's primary effector, primary, primary mode of action. But from a, another stand, well, there, another one, some women lose a lot, have heavier menstrual flows than others and lose a lot of iron and they can become anemic. Well, birth control eliminates yeah. menstruation and can be useful in that regard. Yeah. One of the bigger ones, or potential benefits, and this is for women that have these big performance swings, is it at least stabilizes them, right? It stabilizes their performance. Now you might go, oh, but it's a couple percent lower. Well, true. However, if you've got a female athlete, high level athlete, and they're losing two weeks out of four to quality training, What's worse, losing a couple, you know, losing a couple percents, but being able to train effectively all the time, or losing two weeks of basically yeah. having crud training. And in that vein, right? So again, this is if you've got a female athlete, someone on a time schedule, right? The general public, yes, they all want to be in shape fast, but do they generally have to be in shape by a given date? I mean, fine, weddings, events, like I get that, beach, whatever, but in general, no. Mm -hmm. Let's say you've got a high level female athlete. She's got, she knows that in the fourth week of her cycle, her performance is terrible. What if her national qualifier is that week? What yeah. if her world championships is that week? What if her Olympic final is that week? Oh, yeah. Too bad. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. women, so women, even if you've got a weight class athlete, a power lifter, an Olympic lifter, if you've got one that, and she gains two and a half kilos and her perform, you know, even if her performance doesn't crater, now she can't make weight. Too bad. That's it. You don't get to move yeah. the competition. Yeah. So birth control can be used to regulate the cycle in that regard. And that can be very, very important. Um, and women who have like, you know, severe premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMS and stuff, it helps to eliminate that because it avoids that big hormone crash in week four, which is what's driving all of this. So it's not that birth control is necessarily good or bad. It's a matter, again, as always, of context. Mm -hmm. So for the general public, again, if your goal is not to become pregnant or to deal with whether it's anemia, PMS, PMDD, whatever, maybe that few percent performance doesn't matter to you. Yeah. If you're a female athlete, maybe that performance difference does matter or the, the, if it affects trainability, but you have to weigh it against these other factors. One compromise, again, for female athletes, I don't know what, what probably not the, the necessarily the target audience for your podcast, you know, can do, all right, if birth control does affect trainability, well, just don't take it in the off season and then start it as you get into your competition mm -hmm. season to regulate things for competition. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like an either or, but these are all. And then I will add that the hormonal IUD, like I said, it's pretty much purely local. Very little of the synthetic progestin gets into the bloodstream. It will prevent pregnancy. It will prevent the issues with anemia, but it will not affect menstrual cycle at all, depending on whether or not that's the goal. So if you have a female that just wants to not get pregnant, but is not having other, like, so it won't affect testosterone levels. It won't potentially impair training adaptations or performance. So the hormonal idea of IUD very much lives outside of everything else I talked about. Yeah. Birth control is complicated. Yeah. It's a I realize, I research, realize. And the research is all terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wish they would do a better job with it. So, yeah. but it's, uh, I, does that cover everything? Yeah, that pretty much hits all, all the high points of like the considerations. Um, yeah, Metal Hanselman, I think you also brought about that. If you want, I can send you a PDF later after the podcast. I think you might like it. But I don't really remember what he said. But I think he mentioned this. Same thing, probably. Uh, yeah, a, re a, review, a review paper just came out on this stuff, and they were kind of like, oh, there's no clear effect one way or the other. And, you know, again, when you start taking all these studies, some of which are garbage, just be like, we're going to put them in a blender, you end up with a very non-result when yeah. you start looking at the individual. And I'm not saying that that's an, uh, an invalid way of doing science, but when you look at the end of it, again, you see that a lot of them, the quality is just absolutely yeah. terrible. It's, I, I always know a field is bad because women's menstrual cycle research is just as bad. 
frequently because well so back in the day they relied on self-reporting totally inaccurate oh. like all that data is wrong a lot of the research won't even pay attention to it at all right they'll just be like oh we tested women when because it matters right it absolutely matters when you tested them because yeah. what you have to do to study women is you have to do at least two different tests usually mid follicular and mid luteal if you, you can test a man whenever, right? It doesn't really matter. But to compare women, you got to do at least the two. To be completely accurate, you either have to do ultrasound or take daily blood work to figure out exactly when they are in these phases. I talked to a researcher a bunch of years ago when he was trying to study exercise performance in women. One of his subjects came in and he said, yeah, I started menstruating a day early. He said, cool, see you in a month. We cannot measure you now. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of why women are just not included in exercise science research mm -hmm. because they're just, a, they're difficult to study, which yeah. is not a good reason, but that is what happens. They are far more difficult to study than men because you have to take all this into account. And whenever I, I look at a given area of science and somebody writes an entire paper saying, here are all the mistakes everyone is making and how we need to make it better. That's when I know this area of science is being badly done. Because if you have to go to the trouble to go, here's what you are all doing wrong, mm -hmm. then something is severely wrong. In that. Yeah. And, like, and honestly, this sounds sexist as hell, but it's not. Generally speaking, the better research on women is done by female researchers. Because of course it is. Mm -hmm. Because they actually have context, both personally and otherwise, to actually do this stuff. And I mean, it is. It costs money to do all that stuff. I yeah. get that. But don't just crank out shoddy research that doesn't add anything. And I, yeah, it, it, it frustrates me. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. It, right now, that is currently where my opinion stands. And yeah. since invariably somebody will ask, like, if I had to make a choice, or let's say I had a daughter or a female athlete, and I had to make a choice, my, my first choice would be no birth control at all, yeah. assuming that there are no issues. Like, Same, yeah. mm -hmm. based on what i've seen i think the potential may again high level athlete right would be none at all second would be probably the hormonal iud assuming mm -hmm. there's no menstrual cycle issues because it's local right you said it's yeah because it's almost mm -hmm. purely local yeah. right it will prevent pregnancy like and it has some slight it is it's a minor inpatient procedure there is the potential it can cause scarring it can you know it's not risk-free this is another sort of issue there's also you know going to the pregnancy thing it's like choice can depend on like okay are you in a long-term monogamous relationship that you know you don't want to have kids for three years are you using birth control because you're single and sexually active you know that can if you are in a monogamous you know fine get implant get the little implant it's a minor three years you don't have to worry about any of this stuff yeah. Yeah. right because some are relatively harder and easier to stop Right. If you decide if you're on oral birth control and you decide you want to get pregnant, you just quit taking it. Yeah. A couple months later, you'll be fine. Yeah. Nepo Provera, you quit taking it, and it'll take a year for it to clear your system. Right. Mirena, you can just have it removed. Um, the ring, the patch, you just stop using. So th these are other, all other considerations, just ease of use. So probably Mirena would be my second choice. If they had, if someone was going to use a combined oral birth control. I would pick one if they could get it that had, I think, bioidentical estradiol, just because it, it seems like I said, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of that, and a second generation progestone. And you can look up what those are based on what I think the best picture of the research is. The second generation progestin will have the least potentially negative effect on trainability. There's also the, but there's also the testosterone issue, and that you can't get around except they have shown that DHEA, which is a supplement, dihydroepiandrosterone, DHEA is a primary steroid in women and supplementing with that will raise testosterone even on birth control. But like if I was gonna have to pick one, one oral, it would be combined oral birth control used continuously, monophasic, second generation mm -hmm. birth control. Like that to mm -hmm. me would be I hate to say the best of the worst, but I think the listeners mm -hmm. know what I mean by that mm -hmm. as far as having the least potentially negative effects mm -hmm. while giving the most potentially benefits. Yeah.
I love that. I love that. Can control I, is awful. I can, I can tell. I, one question I have, because I'm just curious since I have you here, something I realized uh, nutritionally is some, most women tend to do worse on intermittent fasting. Like anecdotally, I, I, I realized it as a coach. Is it like something you saw as well? Yeah, it's, I don't, yeah, I've heard, and I've seen people write articles about that and how it's like, the, maybe, I know, I know Martin Birkin years ago wrote something like, because again, women's blood sugar can become very unstable under certain, and I guess he found that shortening the fasting window by a couple hours seemed to help. Mm -hmm. I, I think you've got issues with that psychological. Women are much more prone to eating disorders. You can very easily get into a binge purge kind of pattern with right. that. Right. Like I've seen the theory thrown around, you know, that like, you know, men are hunters. We're basically like, ah, find the big kill, eat all the meat. Women are gatherers and meant to kind of eat more meals during the day. And maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, you look on some forums and do see people reporting that. The problem I always have with those sorts of self-reports, you don't hear people talking about the successes by and large. Mm. Like if you trusted the internet, every single person would have hit a plateau that they couldn't get over because people that are succeeding don't go onto weight loss forums to ask for help. Oh, yeah. So I think, it, I think there's a very much a self, -sel I'm not saying that there's not potentially a problem. Um, but yeah, blood sugar can get goofy. So some, cause I think for some women, especially doing that sort of calorie shifting to one degree or another can be beneficial. And again, so here's another consideration for women that's more practical than physiological. Women on average are smaller than men average have lower energy expenditure than that for a number of reasons, part of which is just being smaller. Smaller body burns less calories. When you're looking at dieting, men have more calories to play with because they're starting from a higher amount, right? If you're a guy and you've got a 2,500 calorie daily energy expenditure and you cut to 1,800, you have a big deficit, it's still a pretty good amount of food. If you're a woman mm -hmm. with an 1,800 calorie maintenance and you want to do a 700 calorie deficit, Mm -hmm. Other calories is not a lot of food, no matter how you cut it. Smaller women, especially, you see these, you know, smaller physique athletes or wake, you know, who are, you know, 50 kilos, 55 kilos. They're trying to diet on 1,200 calories a day, plus cardio, plus weights, because mm -hmm. that's the nature of it. Mm -hmm. You tell them to eat six meals a day is ridiculous, because 200 calories is like two bites of food. For them, A, lower meal frequency is often better because for 300 calorie meals, at least almost a meal, saving more calories, and I'm not saying eliminate morning calories, but eating a little bit less during the day when you're typically at work and busier and shifting more towards the evening can be helpful. Intermittent fasting is kind of the extreme uh, version of that. But I think for a lot of people, and again, this isn't talked about enough. I mean, like I've been writing about cyclical diets for 15 years now, but, and I was a lot more enthusiastic about them when I was younger. And then I sort of learned a couple more things as I got older and got more experience. But for a lot of people, they are very destructive because suddenly what should be, you know, a maintenance day or becomes a two day free for all, pushes people into binge purge patterns, kicks off subclinical eating disorders. Yeah. And frequently those strategies are very much not, but the intermittent fasting people, like everybody, they get turned into, they get a lot of zealotry, oh, yes. a lot of this is the way. And it's like, yeah, for you, and that's fine. I'm not saying they're wrong that it's right for them, but assuming, you know, the, the joke I make on my forum is, do you want to know how someone, do you want to know if someone does intermittent fasting? Uh, no. Don't worry, they'll tell you. Yeah, like um, vegans, <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. Uh, like if the word breakfast comes up in my Facebook group, someone has to chime in. I haven't eaten breakfast for 12 years. I don't uh, care. Yeah. Like, but yes. <laughs> and again, intermittent fasting is great. When it works, it's beautiful. When it doesn't work, it is a disaster. So I don't know if women are more prone to problems with that, but certainly by the time you factor in eating disorders, previous dieting psychology, maybe some physiological issues. Again, women are very prone to having reproductive dysfunction, possibly, you know, at the extremes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've seen in your clients or in your coaching capacity? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Sorry, what, what, what is it? That, like, have you seen that women more so than men have issues with intermittent fasting? 
Yeah, I've, I've seen it, yeah, but I, I wasn't able to tell why. Maybe because of higher cortisol when they don't eat food for a longer time? Or, yeah, or I, like I said, I just don't know. You know, there's there's probably something to it, but I, you know, this is not something that tends to, and, and most of the studies on this tend to be in, you know, overweight individuals. You see a lot of different issues compared to as, as people get even into moderate levels of body fat, a lot of this, this physiology changes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I would just say in that regards, like, yeah, if it is a good strategy for you as an individual, great. Yeah. If you try and it doesn't work, don't do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just a bit worried about women when they start intermittent fasting because some women are more prone to eating disorders and it could lead yes. to eating these long term. Yeah, so. No, absolutely. It can very much become a binge purge pattern. And yeah. in that case, same thing with cyclical diets, same thing with a lot of the, the flexible eating strategies, which, yeah, am I a big believer in, in a general sense? Absolutely. Flexible eating attitudes in the sense of getting away from the black and white, good, bad, thinking about food. Yeah. Absolutely. The flexible eating strategies, the free meals, the refeeds, the if it fits your macros, those were never in the research, ever, ever, ever. It's all about, I sort of, I didn't, I didn't invent them. I formalized them in 2004 when I wrote my book. Talk about flexible eating attitudes and getting people out of, this is a diet food, this is a non-diet food, yeah. good, bad, getting out, of, adopting those attitudes and like, okay, fine, today you had a couple hundred calories more and it's one seventeenth of a pound of fat difference. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, maybe you yeah. adjust a little bit. Maybe yeah. you don't care. Maybe you move on with the rest of your life because in the big, it's more adopting that than this because the specific strategies. And again, who are we talking to? General public who may be coming out of years of certain eating habits, taste buds have adapted, neurochemistry has adapted, giving them these things and going, oh no, you can eat the cookie whenever you want to may do more harm than good. It mm-hmm. might work just fine, mm-hmm. but it may not. Mm-hmm. And the, the if it fits your macros people are just as bad as the, as the intermittent fasting people and just as bad mm-hmm. as everybody else. Because mm-hmm. what they forget is they all came from 10 years of extreme rigid dieting. They've already got these habits locked down. Yeah. Yeah. They can do it. And they forget that the general public may not be able to or yeah. may not be able to now, right? Maybe you need to spend two to three months fairly strictly dieting. And I don't mean like being crazy about it, but just adhering to your diet, taste buds take about six weeks to change, neurochemistry starts to change, food habits start to change. Then you go, okay, maybe I'm gonna try this. And you try it and maybe it works and great. And maybe you try it and you blow up and go off the rails. Well, you've just learned something very important about yourself that maybe try it a different way. Try it like I do, go to the grocery store, buy exactly what you're gonna buy. Mm -hmm. You do that and then find yourself going back to the store for more, not a good strategy for you or maybe mm-hmm. not a good strategy for you now. Try it again in a couple more months. Yeah. 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 We, you know, there are ways to go about this. And so a lot of that stuff that I think is great, even with physique athletes, I've known some, there's a very successful male bodybuilder whose name I never remember. He tried it, he tried the refeeds, he tried all that stuff because you know, it's not for me. But here was his, the reason why for him. For many people, when we go on a diet, flip the diet switch. Mm-hmm. On a diet, dieting is a goal. Sometimes if you unflip the diet switch to have a refeed, a maintenance day, a free meal, frequently you can't get it flipped again. And for him, from a, from a, for him, when he's in contest prep mode and realize, listen, contest prep is six months of starving yourself and trying not to die. Yes. Like no, no joke. It is yeah. start controlled starvation. It is also, you're only trying to be in shape for one day. It is not meant to be long-term, but for him once, and athletes are like this, when it's time, it's time. Oh, yes. For him, that doesn't apply to the general public, right? Or not to that extreme where once you're on, you have, you know, but again, if you unflip it, sneak in a whatever and it doesn't work for you, it's not for you yeah. or not for you right now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so all these kinds of things. And I think, I think uh, intermittent fasting can certainly very much, especially when you get some of the, oh, just eat one meal a day and calories don't matter. And it turns, it gets ugly fast. It gets really, yeah. you come into it so hungry, you eat so much food, then you just feel terrible and gross and sick. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm curious, uh, this was fantastic, by the way. Thank you so much for your answer. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you mentioned uh, refeeds. Uh, I think yes. women should have more frequent refeeds than, than guys, right? Yes. So the idea of a refeed 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna re sort of reframe that because I think as the more I've thought about it, well, I'll get to that. The idea is basically you bring calories to maintenance or slightly above every so often, right? So when we diet, all these hormonal changes, you start to see adaptations to dieting, decreases in metabolic rate, decreases in activity, all this hormonal stuff went right for years that nobody cares about. But it happens. Dieting gets, fat loss gets slower, dieting gets harder, body fights back more. Women's bodies fight back harder and faster than men's. Mm -hmm. And this is evolutionarily based. Women's bodies are set to survive, right? One of my favorite pieces of trivia is that during like famines or in concentration camps, men are far more likely to die than women. Mm -hmm. Women, and, and in a very real way, it's because women were tasked with survival of the human race, mm. right? Very much once a guy has done his, what he has to do for pregnancy, he's not really needed in a bio, in, a, in a, the strictest sense. Like, yeah, if he can provide resources, like, yeah, that's great. But if not, it's up, the woman has to carry the baby to term, make sure it's raised till it's five, so there's a greater chance of likelihood. And in a very real way, if there's limited food, it's better if he dies because yeah. it means more food for the kid, yeah. right? But women's body is very much evolved and, and that's all there, this is one of the big, big, big differences. Women's bodies don't tolerate the same large deficit as men, as an example. And I don't want to get into the reproductive dysfunction thing, but except other than just very briefly to make the point. When women diet very hard, they often will lose their menstrual cycle. They develop amenorrhea or see menstrual cycle dysfunction. And it turns out this is related to something, it's called energy availability, which is calories in minus exercise activity, and exercise calorie expenditure. What you can think of this as the number of calories that are left over to the body to keep everything else running. But certain things are important. Brain has to keep braining, heart has to keep pumping, kidney has to keep kidneying. Many women, many people realize their hair stops growing. Their nails stop mm. growing. Why? You're not going to die if your hair doesn't grow. Yeah. That is energy that the body needs for other things. The immune system will be impaired. Why? You don't need an immune system to stay, keep from dying in the short term. Women's reproductive systems will eventually shut down. Because not only is it not required for life, when you're starving, that's the worst time to become pregnant. And what the research showed is that in women, with an energy availability of 30 calories per kilogram lean body mass. Below that level, problems start. Bone mineral density is lost. Reproductive system dysfunction starts. Men don't see that problem till half as many calories, about 15. You can put a man on a staggering deficit and it won't affect him hardly at all. Put a woman on the same deficit, it will just crush her hormones yeah. will drop. Her thyroid hormones can drop in five days. Energy expenditure can drop within yeah. five days. Cortisol goes up. It all goes within five days of women doing that sort of thing. So men's bodies handle this much, much, much better than I'm women. I'm just curious to calculate that. You said 13 calories per... 30. A 30. 30, 30 zero, uh, okay. Three, three, zero, three okay. zero. So a woman who was 60 kilos, that would be an energy of ill, well, had 60 kilos of lean body mass, right? Only, mm -hmm. only that counts. Pretty muscular, 1800 though. calorie, mm -hmm. yeah, very much. Let's say 50, 50 <laughs> kilos of lean body mass. That would be mm. 1500 calories, but that's not as calorie intake. So let's say she was eating 2000 mm. and exercising 500. Her energy availability would be 1500. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If she were eating 1500 and doing no exercise, it would be 1500, right? It's mm. the difference. Yep. It's not calorie intake, it's not calorie balance, it's intake minus activity. I'm just curious for the definition, uh, because I tell my clients to increase their steps, not to do cardio, for example. Would it still go in there or is that good? It's a good question. It's a real good question. Probably to a degree. There's probably an intensity factor. Some of it, it seems to be related to gluca. It's, I don't have a good answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I'll mm -hmm. find out, but it's a, it's a really good question. Like it, it takes a lot, right? If you even get to 10,000 steps, that's the equivalent of walking what? Like three miles it's like six kilometers seven, or something seven, like I think that it's, for me personally it's 7.2 yeah but you got men got longer legs so they walk they go further um it's a couple <laughs> hundred cal you know it's a couple 300 calories a day mm. it's not like doing an you know an hour of hard cardio and like you I mean usually it's you have to have calories very very low and a lot of activity like it can be done 
Um, the point of all this being that just women's bodies are far more sensitive to this stuff than men's. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of bringing calories back to maintenance more frequently, the idea is to provide sufficient calories, raise energy availability, reverse some of the hormonal adaptations. Women may need to do it slightly more frequently than men. Now, there is a lot of debate. I think Menno is very against. The, the research on this is very indirect, right? And I've done the entire podcast debating, even with myself. We know that raising calories to maintenance or slightly above reverses some of the hormonal adaptations. However, does that significantly reverse the metabolic rate adaptations? If it does, for how long does it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I want to know. I want someone to do the right. The right. Yeah. There are a couple studies in the pipeline that are finally going to measure what needs to be measured. Admittedly, some of what I wrote about in 2004 were inferences. Mm -hmm. It's a little more debatable mm -hmm. now to me. There are still benefits of doing this. Some of it is adherence. It refills muscle glycogen for training. It helps reduce cortisol, which can help with water retention. Like there's no doubt that there are benefits to one degree or another. The question is whether it is truly reversing the metabolic yeah. rate effects. Yeah. And as yeah. much as I would love to say it absolutely does, at this point in my career, I can't. Yeah. Just I depends want to see on the, the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. It just depends on the body weight, right? The body fat percentage. Uh, yes, like at, at higher body fat percentages, a lot of this doesn't matter, the body, but it's, you know, as, as, as you get much, much leaner, the body starts to fight back much harder, right? Because yeah. you're basically starving yourself to death. Sure. You know, I've talked to some physique coaches. They find that, that having maintenance calorie days helps with performance, helps prevent some of the water retention that would otherwise occur. I want to see more data. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. if we and, and, and the way I'm reconceptualizing it now, the problem with the refeed concept is with athletes going, all right, why well, you eat, you know, double your 12 grams per kilo of carbohydrates and, and carb load. If you're an athlete that works for the general public, it tends to yeah, backfire sure. mm -hmm. and cheat days are a nightmare. They need to stop calling them cheat days, right? There's nothing that gets right back to that good, bad thing. There's nothing good about cheating, right? You cheat on your taxes, you cheat on your a test, you cheat on your significant other. There's no positive connotation of the word cheating. And what I've seen people do over the years, a cheat day is not just a day where I'm going to eat normally at maintenance. It is a day of, I want to see how much garbage I can stuff down my throat till I get sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's another set of research called alt -rel alternate day fasting intermittent calorie restriction which alternates these huge calorie deficits with just eating normally. What they find is that the people on the, the, the non-dieting days eat at about maintenance or five or 10% above or below, right? You're not telling them, I want you to refeed and over consume carbohydrates. That I think sends a, some people down a very bad mm -hmm. road because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's no longer, I'm just gonna have a normal eating day. It's I must force feed myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in the women's book I talk about, I think I sort of, I talked about refeeds and I was like, we're just going to start to call them a maintenance day. Mm -hmm. Same basic idea. Um, it le you know, again, if you're an athlete training very intensely, a couple, three hours a day, yeah, you need to really jack in the carbs for a day or two. You need to carb load. General public, just have a normal eating day. Yeah. You don't have to go out, yeah. like just don't have yeah. to go out of your way. Make sure you get enough protein. Yeah. Don't go crazy trying to stuff all the food down the food hole. Um, I think that avoids uh -huh. psychological issues. Yeah, that, that's what I'm to, sorry to interrupt you. What I'm thinking is for a general population, would say one day of refeed will be enough just to get rid of the psychological issues and the, uh, the yeah. restore glycogen. But if you look like physiologically, I think you talked about it one year ago, 72 hours is at least the least amounts of refeeds you do, right? For like leptin, ghrelin, all these. Pro, yeah, I mean, like we know that leptin, one of the big hormones in this will go up very quickly. I mm -hmm. don't think it's going to send enough of a signal to really reverse things. Yeah. I think probably two to three days is, and, and so in that range, like, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of very interesting studies in this regard. So the researcher that identified the energy availability thing, it's like, okay, in animals, if you feed them all the food for one day, everything reverses. So she tried that in humans, five days, very low energy availability. Then she fed them something like, it's like 6,400 calories. It was something just nuts. I mean, it sounds awesome. 
in a day. In a day. No difference. Mm -hmm. No change in hormones. Mm -hmm. Then another researcher did something very similar. Three days of total fasting, measured it, all the hormones dropped, all the standard stuff. And then they just, for the hell of it, they were like, we're gonna let them eat normally for two days and just remeasure. And within two days of normal eating, all the, the hormonal changes had reversed. So this sort of tells me one day every five, at least it's a very hard, again, these were average leanness women. One day, probably not enough. Two days will reverse the hormonal adaptations. Mm -hmm. Will it reverse the metabolic adaptations? Mm -hmm. I want to see the data. I'm prepared to be yeah. wrong about this. I yeah. hope I'm right. You know, another thing to at least address, um, you know, I mean, still, I think the idea of putting in a normal maintenance day every so often from an adherence standpoint, right? One of the things that we, we tend to think of like, okay, you're just going to diet every day for the rest of your life. That yeah. is absolutely overwhelming psychologically. Yeah. Yeah. Even the most highly trained athletes take a day off a week yeah. generally. Why? Because otherwise it's just mentally too grueling to have to do that every single day. So a lot of these alternate day fasting, intermittent calories, so they're like, all right, big deficit two or three days in a row, eat a normal day. Mm -hmm. Big deficit for a couple of days, eat a normal day. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's one thing for me to tell you, I want you to diet for the next four weeks without a break. Then to tell you, I want you to diet for three days and then have a normal day. Anyone yeah. can diet for three days, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you get a day, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It is a mental break. Now, again, if you find that that day throws you off the rails, it's not yeah. for you, mm -hmm. but, and you don't, again, you don't have to go out of your way to overeat, just eat a normal day. Even if you end up a little bit higher than you'd planned, it's still offset by the diet days. It's a long-term thing. Yeah. But then there's the, then there's the concept of the full diet break. And the full diet break was meant to be a 10 to 14 day phase where you brought calories to maintenance. It was meant to divide up dieting blocks. And I'm starting to be of the opinion, like, again, the one day at maintenance, refill muscle carbohydrate, give your mind a break, lowers cortisol, helps water retention, et cetera, et cetera. Like there are benefits. They may not be hugely metabolic in a fat loss sense. The diet break, I think probably has more potential in this regard. And mm -hmm. the idea, because now we're bringing calories to maintenance for two weeks. All the, the hormones have a chance to not only reverse, but stay there for a while. Yeah. And there was a paper, I think last year, it was the Matador trial. They, I don't know why they give these things these silly names lately. <laughs> and they did that. They either dieted two weeks on, two weeks off, or straight through. And I mean, there's some issues with the study because there always is. And they found that, yeah, the, the, there wasn't quite as much of a change in, in metabolic rate energy expenditure. It's good for that. I think that has more potential benefits in this regards. But as much as anything, A, again, it gives you a break point, right? So if yeah. I told you to diet 12 weeks straight or 24 weeks straight, that's a nightmare. If I told you to diet 12 weeks and then take two weeks of normal eating, well, okay, that's only 12 weeks. But in those 12 weeks, I say, have a maintenance day every two or three days. Yeah. If the, I liken it to driving well. In the US, we drive cross country, but you know, if you're driving, you gotta drive for 24 hours. It is overwhelming mentally. But if you know you're gonna to stop to get gas and go to the bathroom every three hours, well, now you're only driving for three hours at a time rather than 24 hours of it yeah. without a break. Yeah. But more importantly than even that, or as importantly than diet break, and this is again, general public, learning how to eat at maintenance. Mm. Because of this, I've been talking about this for 15 years mm -hmm. and we know how to get people to lose weight. We've known that for 50 years. I see another, I saw a paper last week the benefits of dietary fiber. Look, we get it. I don't need to see another study that fiber helps with weight loss. We, we got this. The problem where we're failing people is long-term maintenance. Yeah. Everybody loses weight. Most people don't keep it off. It's a good weight point, loss yeah. isn't the issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, weight loss is the issue in as much as losing weight and using you know, a, an approach that is potentially more long-term sustainable. Maintenance yeah. is the issue. Learning to eat at maintenance is a skill like everything else, the other things I've talked about. And it's part, and, and maintenance is often harder. A diet is a goal. I'm aiming for this target. You're trying to gain weight, muscle gain or whatever, gaining weight is a goal. Maintenance is weird, nebulous. Eh, 
I don't really have, I mean, I'm trying to avoid something rather than, it's a very nebulous area for mm -hmm. people, myself included, because Same. it's not as explicit a goal. Mm -hmm. And finding a strategy to eat at maintenance in the long term is really the, and that goes back to dieting and eating is a learning, it's a learning experience. Figuring out what set of strategies might give you the, you have to practice it. And that to me, well, again, context. So I'm dealing with an athlete. I got to deal with a couple different things. One metabolic slowdown, one performance loss, one, one, and one, when do they have to be in shape? Do I even have time for this? Right, because make no mistake, people got contest lean without diet breaks for decades. Uh -huh. They've never been required. Are they helpful? This is the question. May they optimize them. That, but if we're talking with the general public, A, they're not probably getting to their goal in one dieting phase. You're looking at 12 weeks of dieting, however long it is, couple, you know, however much weight they've got to lose. Could be a while. You need to learn how to practice, you need to practice eating a maintenance and learn what set of strength. And that yeah. two week block, on top of giving you a, an end point where you get a mental and physical break, allows you to try these things. Mm -hmm. right? In the study, I mean, I was, mm -hmm. in the study that I pulled this out of, and, and this is still one of my favorite studies by Wing et al. And they, what they wanted to find out was why do people fall off the rails when they diet, right? Because that's what usually happens. We're dieting, we're dieting, we're dieting. Something happens, we give up. Two weeks later, we've quit completely. And they want to, so like, all right, we're going to take a group of people, diet them for six weeks, and then tell them to take two weeks off, diet them and take, and to see what happens. And what they saw was that nobody gained weight. Nobody had trouble getting back on their diet. They, the study failed completely to show, to study what they wanted to study. But to me, the observation was, it's one thing to be dieting and fall off and feel like you've failed. It is another thing to be dieting and have this two weeks as part of your plan. Mm. I think that when the researchers said, we want you to take two weeks off, mentally they were like, oh, that's just part of what I'm supposed to do. They didn't see it as failing the diet because it put them in control mm. of what they were doing. Yeah. And that too, same thing with the maintenance days. It's one thing to be like, I'm dieting, I'm dieting. Oh man, I want a cookie. And then suddenly you've eaten the bag. <laughs> then to go, I am planning to eat at maintenance because it is part of my plan. That puts you in control of it. Yeah. That's still saying it can't go awry, mm -hmm. but it is psychologically very different. Yeah, yeah. So the full diet break is a time to test different things. Like, yes, you should be maintaining some of what you did during the diet. Keep your protein high, keep training, introduce other foods. All right, cool. Can you have small amounts of treat or junk foods in the house? And Cool. If not, you've learned something important. Mm -hmm. I've started doing consults lately and I feel obligated to mention that, but I, I had one and they told me very flat out, they go, I, maintenance doesn't work for me. I cannot eat maintenance daily. They go, when I'm at work during the week, I can control my diet rigidly. Exercise in the morning, work is fine. Because, but on the weekends, I go eat at my significant other's parents' house. I can't control my food. Now I could have told them I want you to eat maintenance seven days a week and that would have failed them. I said, all right, well, cool. Maintain your diet during the five days and then mm -hmm. don't worry about it on the weekend. Yeah. Now, most of you would go, oh my God, that's terrible advice. Why? I care what works. And for that individual, and even there, they were like, all right, if I diet for five days and eat whatever I want for two, I offset my results. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, well, this is easy. Your diet is six days of dieting and one day of not caring. And your mm -hmm. maintenance is five days of dieting and two days of eating whatever mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. Boom, problem solved. Yeah. Yeah. So you're having to, and it, that may be the case. If someone is having trouble eating at maintenance every day, well, maybe their maintenance is, you know, to eat normally and then have a couple of low calorie days. I believe Menno is a, somebody I did a podcast with, you know, Menno, the 5 2 plan where you eat normally for five days a week, you do a hard deficit two days a week. Yeah. Like, I'm not like 50% of maintenance, right? There's a paper I read years ago called Fasting the Ultimate Diet. And the guy was like, look, when people don't eat, they lose their appetite. They lose weight at the most rapid rate possible. Carrying excess body fat, you don't lose a lot of muscle. Just give them a vitamin. And, but as importantly, he said, it teaches people to be hungry. Mm. Because we're in the modern world. We're like, oh my God, I'm a little hungry. I'm starving. No, you're not. Yeah. You're not starving. Yeah. You're hungry. There's a difference. That's true, yeah. But one of the things he said, he goes, but here, because again, when you're maintaining, People expect that their weight will stay, that, that it's not, it, it, it goes up and it goes down and it'll fluctuate throughout the year and et cetera, et cetera. So A, divest yourself of that idea. But his point was if someone is 
at a weight loss and their weight starts trending up. He goes, well, they've already proven to themselves that they can go without food for a couple of days. So boom, fast for a couple of days, bingo, you're right back to where you haven't lost any of your results. Mm -hmm. So that, and I'm not saying do that. My point being that during this diet break is a time to test drive different strategies and fine, your weight goes up by a pound or two. Some of it's water. Maybe you gain a pound of fat. Who cares? You've lost, sorry, half a kilo. You've lost five or six kilos already. You know what to do. As soon as you start dieting again, boom, now you get another diet break. Take what worked the previous time, try some new yeah. things. If something yeah. doesn't work, figure out why. Figure yeah. out an eventuality, figure out a strategy. So yeah. I think for the general public, as much as any metabolic effect, the full diet break gives them a chance to practice maintenance. Yeah. And that long-term is key. I love that. I love that. Thanks so much for that. I would say it's a perfect end message for our viewers. Yeah. This is actually something I will implement as well, like the mindset of learning the skill of maintenance. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Because I, and, and just as a last thought, if mm -hmm. you talk to people, like everyone I've done podcasts with, like again, most of us have been doing this for years. And I started when I was 15. Even now, if I don't really pay much attention to my intake, like admittedly, I eat like a 14 year old just because I'm a single male. I eat a lot of, I eat a lot of cereal because I can. I, I got done being an athlete years ago, but even so my baseline eating patterns are so well established at this point. I've been oh, doing yeah. this for three decades, right? Yeah. I always get a ton of protein at every meal. I just add whatever and don't care about it too much. I can hold, you know, 12 to 15% without even trying that hard. If I want to get mm. leaner, I got to clamp it down. But, yeah. by, but again, I've been doing this. And most people I've talked to who've been in this industry, they're like, yeah, I've figured out for myself by trying every magic diet ever, yeah. what set of, and every person has a different set of strategies, but we've found what allows us in the long term to do what we need to do. Yeah. yeah. So, but it that. does, it takes time, it takes practice. I love that for sure, for sure. So where can people find you, Lyle? So my website is bodyrecomposition.com. It's where all my articles are. That will take you to my store. Here's some of my books. I've got, I said, I've got consulting, the women's book. And it's, it make, it's not an easy read. It is very technical. It's very long. You know, you can start with what we've talked about, some of the general information. If you really want to learn everything about what's going on in your body, whether as a woman or as a coach of women, yeah, it's the most comprehensive resource yeah. you'll find. I'm probably most active on Facebook. I've got a very active Facebook group called Body Recomposition. I'm on there daily. One of the things that's very valuable about it, I tend to attract experts in their field. I have like mm -hmm. five top-notch physios, uh, a fantastic OBGYN. Um, it boggles my mind. Someone will post a question about the, the most rarest, oddest disease situation you've ever heard of. Like I've never heard of it. And four people will be like, I experienced it. And one person will be like, I'm a physician who specializes in that. I'm like, what, what, what in the world? <laughs> yeah. what, what? I, it, I learn from my group all the time. Yeah. So any question yeah. I can't address, because I'm very much a generalist about like, especially medical stuff, somebody in my group will know the answer. Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing to me on yeah. a daily basis. Um, um, I do have an Instagram. It's at McDonald Lyle. It is mainly dumb jokes. I do not go there often. Yeah. When I do, it's to tell stupid jokes and occasionally share article content. I saw the thing on uh, Jurassic Park Lost World you did. I saw that. Yeah, thing. well, yes. I, I, during some point, I watched all the Jurassic World movies and they were all terrible. Um, <laughs> Except the first so, one. Yeah. Except the first one. The first one. I mean, in Jurassic Park, the first one was good. The other one. Jurassic Park, yeah. the first one, and they just got progressively yeah. dumber as they went. That's actually true. Yeah. I realize. Yeah. <laughs> and I, they're doing another one. They're doing a third Jurassic World, and it's going to be absolutely yeah. terrible. I hope I'm they sorry. just end it. So, yeah. so yeah. So my website, my store, and then Facebook is probably the the best place to find awesome. me if you've got questions awesome. or whatever. Yeah. Thanks so much. I urge everyone everyone to buy that book. I would buy it for sure, especially women. I should read that because there's so many myths out there. And yes. uh, yeah, thanks so much for listeners. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Cheers.